good evening friends uh, iags always reaches you with fabulous academic program we have been running many successful events with high intensity academics with eminent national and international faculty over the last year in the, under the leadership of professor sunil papad our national president of the iags ladies and gentlemen iags prime time is a fortnightly event which brings in both eminent national and international speakers showcasing the best of the talents iags always tries very hard in disseminating the minimally invasive surgery education for the benefit of our colleagues and our upcoming residents in this ongoing endeavor our president professor sunil papad and the entire team has planned a very brilliant academic program on various aspects of minimally invasive hernia ladies and gentlemen professor sunil papad is a preeminent person known to everyone and as a matter of protocol it is my responsibility to introduce our president professor sunil papad has taken in the most difficult time of the corona pandemic where we were starting up with physical program we had to go back to virtual restarted physical and go back virtual a very very tough time indeed for our president in spite of that iags has done all the mandatory programs and in fact we have created more new programs and newer options also and we have done it very successfully professor sunil papad is a chairman of nidhi hospital in ahmedabad he heads the uh, minimal invasive surgery department as well as he is an eminent forget surgeon with special interest on endotherapy as well he also serves as a visiting professor as a honorary professor to the gsl medical college who has bestowed with him as a honorary professor of gsl medical college in the field of gi surgery may I have the honor of inviting our president to tell few words and welcome us over to you mr president thank you dr kanagwell for kind words uh, good evening friends, ladies and gentlemen igs uh, members and our uh, surgical friends across the world who have been passionately watching igs prime time since last two years friends <clears throat> iags has come forward with another edition of uh, iags prime time tonight once again it's wednesday and once again it's iags prime time you have been supporting us in all the iags activities we have a family of 8500 iags members now and uh, over the last 12 months we had seven months of uh, on site online programs and only five months of on site programs but in that five months with your uh, lots of support and enthusiasm and hard work of our ec members uh, we could do several fiags and efigs programs on site and we could do five programs in advanced super specialty of I, of laparoscopic surgery first time we could do falls robotics in new delhi first time there was fiags in goa and this was all possible because of the humongous support from all the iags members across the country <clears throat> friends simultaneously we were doing the online programs also and uh, since last five weeks <clears throat> because of the third wave of the covid we had to stop the on site programs and go back again to the virtual platform among the virtual platform uh, we have been doing igs prime time and various master classes last sunday there was a master class on safe laparoscopic cholecystectomy and uh, there were almost 50 faculties from igs and uh, there were 18 lect and a panel discussion which lasted almost 1 hour the entire program went on for 8 and 1/2 hours and we were very happy to see that there were more than 2200 Uh, surgeons who viewed the program and participated in the program that just shows your interest in the igs activities and that boost us our morale and enthusiasm to give you more and more better programs because of the covid third wave we had to postpone our igs national congress 2022 it will be held in june 9 to 12 june in rajmundry 
and i welcome you all to raj mandri for a wonderful national congress friends tonight again we have a galaxy of stars the best of the best surgeons in hernia surgery tonight in various fields from various parts of the country and they are going to showcase the best of the procedures and particularly how you can adopt the procedure and how it can be helpful to you in your day to day practice and surgeries thank you all once again and welcome to tonight's program of igs prime time over to dr kanagar thank you uh, mr president now uh, i request uh, our honorary secretary dr ishwar murthy sir also to chip in we have a uh, lot of very uh, lot of talks today showcasing the best of the skill sets and best of the types of procedure so we warmly welcome all of you on to the doctlexis platform ijs facebook live and under the youtube platforms today the course of uh, the program is like this we have the first talk by dr ajay kriplani sir on tapp step by step followed by dr rajesh kular from delhi who is going to speak about tapp then our president comes in to talk about the ipom plus for ventral hernia then dr shivakumar sir from kanyakumari is going to talk about scola then we move on to something more uh, complex and uh, more demanding procedures dr ramesh punjani sir from mumbai is going to talk about the component separation for ventral hernias then uh, the most important uh, task for the day the panel discussion is going to be moderated by and another than our past president and trustee dr ramesh agarwal sir ladies and gentlemen i have the honor of inviting professor ajay kriplani sir to start his talk share his powerpoint and start his talk thank you very much sir ishwar sir yeah. thank you thank you uh, dr ajay kriplani sir please uh, start sharing the screen and uh, viewers we are very happy to have dr ajay kriplani a teacher and trainer par excellence at present working in uh, the 40s kurugram and uh, you all know he has been training all the young surgeons for the last three decades in the art and science of laparoscopy he is uh, he was the first one to do the lap splenectomy in india and his videos are always a great treat to watch in the youtube i am sure hundreds of time i have seen very self explanatory i am waiting to hear i am sure every time when you listen to him you will get new points i am sure we are all eager like anybody else and over to ajay sir thank you uh, thank you very much dr kanaga well thank you dr ishwar moti thank you president iags and the our team i thank you for inviting me to deliver this lecture sir uh, we are seeing your middle slide yeah i am in the somewhere in the middle while i was checking yes sir when we tested yes so i have been asked to talk about uh, tips in the repair of laparoscopic inguinal hernia repair the tapp procedure and i bring you compliments from fortis memorial research institute gurgaon which uh, the department of minimal access surgery is accredited for the fellowship in mis by national board of examination we all know that groin hernia surgery is the commonest surgery for a male in the world there is a high case load and it is important to understand the finer aspect of the laparoscopic surgery of doing a good repair so that our results can improve there are two standard techniques tapp or the total extrapedal repair called as tep basically both the procedures are the same the only difference being in tp you straight land up into the extrapedal space by creating the space which does not exist and in the tapp you go to the peritoneal cavity give an incision of the peritoneum and mm -hmm. enter the same space so basically both the procedures are working in the same field you are using the same mesh and i will talk about trans abdominal pre peritoneal procedure before you start the surgery it is important to understand that the field of tapp or tp repair is a large complex field with unfamiliar structures it is not a mirror image of open surgery that we were taught during our medical school and one has to understand the anatomy because there are very important structures in the vicinity which if damaged can lead to a lot of complications and there is an advanced laparoscopic surgery 
and since it is an advanced laparoscopic surgery it's a complex laparoscopic surgery it is associated with a learning curve the learning curve has to be calculated to be about 30 surgeries and during this 30 surgeries during the learning curve you have a longer over time during this surgery the complications are higher 11.7 percent versus zero percent by expert hands there is more delay in return to work which is the main advantage of laparoscopic hernia repair and there's a higher recurrence rate in the hand of those who are learning a complication a higher recurrence rate of 12 percent and remember that during this time the patient expectations are very high because the cost hospital cost is higher than open surgery so on one hand the patient is spending more it is getting he is getting less for what he is paying during the learning curve and that is the reason why many surgeons cannot start a laparoscopic hernia repair unless they overcome the learning curve if you are not well prepared this is the picture you will see a very confusing picture not being able to understand what you are seeing not believing your own eyes and they're going to land into trouble what McCormick said long time back that complications in laparoscopic inguinal hernia repair are reflection of the learning curve and patient selection and are not inherent to the technique so beside the learning curve patient selection is also very important during the learning curve remember that right side hernia repair is easier than left side a direct repair is easier than indirect repair therefore when you starting you start right direct hernia don't venture in your initial experience hernia into it it is hernia into it is incarcerated hernia that the external ring balloon hernias and irreducible hernia on the left side make sure left sided irreducible hernia is always a sliding hernia unless proved otherwise and sigmoid colon forming the wall of the sac therefore never venture into that unless you are really an expert it the, before a left irreducible hernia repair you should prepare the bowel to empty the colon of the hard fecolate which may make reduction extremely difficult and you should handle the left colon extremely gently while trying to reduce it now remember that there are two fields anterior abdominal wall and posterior abdominal wall divided by the iliopubic tract iliopubic anterior to it is anterior abdominal wall posterior to it is posterior abdominal wall and section each portion is divided into two portions by a vessel in the anterior abdominal wall by inferior epigastric vessel there's a lateral field and there's a medial field there is nothing important in the lateral field you don't have to worry about anything in the lateral field all the problems all the important structures all the delicate anatomy all the complicated situations lie need to the anterior abdominal wall similarly on the posterior abdominal wall which is posterior to the iliopubic tract all the important problems lie medial to the external iliac vessels laterally there is nothing unless you are bent upon damaging the nerves in the triangle of pain which are so deep so inaccessible you will not damage anything on the lateral side so remember when you are doing a laparoscopic inguinal hernia repair your focus of cautious should be on the medial side of the dissection in both anterior abdominal wall and the posterior abdominal wall what lies on the medial side of the abdominal wall is anterior abdominal wall but sometimes and crossing the superior, uh, superior ramus of the pubis going towards the obturator fossa and sometimes it can be larger and similarly there are rectusal vessels here going from the inferior epigastric to the rectal muscle and you can see this is the vas deferens but the external vessels this is the medial field and sometimes it can really be life threatening being a very abnormally large obturator vessel crossing your field and if you do anything foolish here anything and you lose not being very careful you can damage and cause torrential bleeding and that is why it is called as of that corona mars and this is the external like vessel you have to be very careful about that and on the posterior abdominal wall on the medial side there is vas deferens which is located more deep as compared to gonadal vessels which are more lateral so remember during a dissection you should concentrate more on the lateral side 
laterally posterior to the because they are covered with fat and you should not try to expose these important thin structures which otherwise are deeply seated and are away from the operative field. Now the most, they say that well bigger is half done. The most important part in TAPP is the incision in the peritoneum when we start. And look, this, look at this video carefully. That's an indirect hernia. And this is an epigastric vessel. This is the transverse abdominis muscle covered by peritoneum. These are the arching fibers. And you hold the peritoneum, pull it internally, medially, and give an incision with a scissor laterally. And you can see the layer that we are dividing is the peritoneum. And deep to the layer, peritoneum, there's a clear cut fascia, which is the fascia transverse. Stylus. The correct place lies deeper to the fascia transverse, stylus, not between the peritoneum and the fascia transverse, stylus, but anterior to the fascia. Look at the picture how the carbon dioxide enters the right plane and makes the dissection for you. So if you are, if the, if, the, if the plane is not apparent, if the plane is not clearly made out by the CO2, then you are in the wrong plane. And the most important indication of being in the wrong plane is that you will cause either bleeding if you go deeper or you will go tear the peritoneum and then buttonhole you for picture. Number plane lies anterior to the deep layer of the fascia transversalis. See how we uh, TAPP repair. All pictures and videos you will see are for the right side. This is the medial umbilical ligament, the, the triangle of doom, the iliac vessels, the incision we know we have already made. And so when you develop the plane between the abdom anterior abdominal wall and the plane, you should all not hold the parent gently by pushing it and dissect more first on the medial side so that first structure that you identify is the superior remnants of the pubis and the uh, and the lig and the ligament and then you dissect laterally lateral to the epigastric vessel you can see that and you can see light pops out it is very very important to remove this lipoma otherwise the patient will continue to have a bulge feeling of bulge and will not be very happy by you're just putting a mesh. So this lipoma must be excised and the lipoma is in close vicinity with the gonadal vessels. So you should carefully descend the lipoma from the gonadal vessel, maintaining the vascularity of the testes. So you can see the Cooper's ligament. And you should dissect out this area of the femoral ring so that you are sure you're not missing a femoral hernia. That is the medial dissection, and you dissect the cord structures, strip the peritoneum from the cord structures, bring the peritoneum posteriorly to develop the triangle of doom from the angle of doom. You dissect posteriorly till the vas turns medially, and then laterally the dissection is easiest. Just few gentle strokes on the fat and the peritoneum, uh, the fat will reveal the swas muscle. The swas muscle and laterally the field is easiest to make. So remember, the most difficult part is. The cord structure, this from the cord structure, and the most easier part is the left side. Now, dissection is the most crucial point in surgery. Learning, you should do sufficient dissection, otherwise, you will land up in recurrence. Unless you do a sufficient dissection, you cannot place a large mesh in that area. And if you put a small mesh in this area because your space is not enough, then there will be recurrence. Similarly, if you are dis not dissected enough and you put a large mesh, the mesh will get folded up and then again there will be recurrence. So the most crucial point in preventing the recurrence, improving your outcome is make a large pouch where a large mesh can adequately sit without getting folded up. So you should dissect medially for an indirect hernia up to the midline. And in a direct hernia, which is more medially placed, you must cross the midline and go three centimeters on the contralateral side so that your mesh overlaps at least four to 4.5 centimeters on the medial side. Laterally, you should be beyond anterior superior leg spine, superiorly midway between the pubic symphysis and the peritoneum, and below, posteriorly strip the peritoneum to bear the cord structures till the vas turns medially. If you do not dissect here, 
then when you put the mesh and close the peritoneal flap the lower border of the mesh will get folded and there will be recurrence underneath the mesh so that's creating the triangle of doom from angle of doom and you can see that the vas deferens is turning medially and there's a large space dissected out here basically in lap in one hernia repair is a half stopa you no know, stopa put a bilateral mesh all the time this is a stopa cut into half you widely overlap the myopectal orifice of fischard earlier we used to use 15 into 12 cm mesh but as our experience has grown we are using larger and larger meshes entire myopectal orifice must be covered adequately on all sides and the mesh defect ratio that should be almost 36 into 1 the the defect is generally 4 cm in size so you should put a mesh which is 36 times larger than the defect and now more and more we are using a 17 into 12 cm mesh which is 204 square cm we make it by cutting the 30 into 30 cm mesh into pieces and then using this you can see this this mesh is always bigger than 15 cm mesh is rolled with a and fixed with a central stitch here no slit should be match, match made in the mesh it is a see through mesh proline three corners are rounded off except the lower lateral point side of the mesh wide overlap on all sides lightweight meshes have been completely abundant during laparoscopic hernia repair there is no role for lightweight meshes if you put a lightweight mesh here you can see what happened this is a patient who came to us after a bilateral recurrence after using a lightweight mesh the swedish hernia registry has shown that the recurrence in lightweight meshes is 4% per compared to 1% in heavyweight meshes and the most evident it is most evident in direct hernias and defects more than 3 cm similarly other randomized trial other uh, systemic reviews have shown uh, heavyweight mesh and lightweight have a risk of pain have mesh has higher risk of recurrence which is clinically which is statistically significant many such studies are now available and lightweight mesh remember has no role in laparoscopic hernia fixate at four points two tacks at the pubic ramus one tack at the upper medial corner one tack in the upper lateral corner and one tack just above the defect if it is a direct defect then above the direct defect if it is a indirect defect then above the indirect defect the peritoneum is always closed with suture use least amount of tacks the more tacks you use the more the pain so if you want to keep the patient comfortable four to five tacks on one side should be enough otherwise patient will have more post operative pain and this is how the post operative picture should look like very wide overlap 3 cm below the pubic ramus the cooper's ligament this is the these are the cord structures over which the mesh is fitting and adequate lateral cover and adequate medial cover if you don't fix a mesh i can show you innumerable pictures of patients coming to us after the laparoscopic hernia repair from outside where the mesh got displaced because the mesh was not fixed this is one such picture on the right side the mesh has gone gone below and uh, laterally no tax another mesh getting folded and displaced another mesh this is on the left side the mesh is outward and upwards another recurrence the mesh shrivel like a lump exposing the direct hernia another mesh again because not fixed it gets moved it gets migrated another mesh these are all recurrences which came to us after a previous laparoscopic repair done outside because the mesh i can keep on show you these pictures and you know therefore we always advocate that meshes should be fixed at minimum three points now about the direct hernias direct hernias are a totally different ball game it is the easiest hernia to do again this is a right sided laparoscopic direct hernia repair these are the cord structures going it's a punch out defect unlike the indirect hernia which is a shelving defect and there's there's no support anteriorly so after giving an incision about which we have already discussed continuing medially all that you need to do is you need to dissect medially first and you will not see the cooper's ligament till you have reduced the sac and you keep pulling the sac internal the sac adherent this uro sac blocks the abdominal wall 
you can push it with the scissors you can push it with a grass atraumatic grasper but all you need to do is give an internal traction to the sac and push the pseudo sac externally which basically is taken transversal is fascia and there's a clear vascular plane you do not need any energy you don't need to cut anything and this is the defect so direct hernias are what it is easy to do and they should this is and this is the femoral vessel axillary lac vessels you can see axillary lac vessels so to make sure that you're not missing a femoral hernia so direct hernias should be the first part of the uh, learning curve of these patients and it is very common after direct hernias to have a seroma formation so always to prevent the seroma in the post operative period because the patient comes to you with a hernia which to is prevent a seroma formation we always in direct hernias tag the pseudo sac with the rectus muscle this not only obliterates the dead space and uh, prevents the seroma but also gives support anteriorly to the mesh and prevents anterior migration of the mesh so this is how we tackle the problem of uh, seroma formation and the preventing increasing our improving our results now when you are dealing with a large hernia be very careful it is not for the beginners because it's a complete sac difficult to reduce may have lots of contents the technique is entirely different you give the incision you raise the flap you identify the sac and now you pull the sac inwards and medially and tease the spermatic cord away from the sac you don't dissect the sac away from the cord but you dissect the cord away from the sac that is the that is the technique you can see that this hernia is more and more pulled medially as you do dissection and after you have cleared anteriorly you move the sac anti clockwise by holding the posterior wall you can see that and then further dissect the posterior aspect of the sac the cord because the cord is posterior to the sac so keep on moving the sac anti clockwise so that you get an exposure of the posterior wall and if you can dissect the complete sac it is all right otherwise you can divide the sac with an energy source so that the cut end of the sac will lie distal to the external inguinal ring so that is a sac divided you can see the inside the cut end of the sac is gone into the scrotum and then the peritoneum is dissected over the cord structure so that you see the medial turn of the vas deferens once you have seen this and dissected laterally and expose the entire cord structures including the arching fibers of the transversus muscle a mesh is placed a larger mesh is required for a larger defect suture the peritoneum and then most importantly suture this cut end of the peritoneum otherwise small bowel will migrate into the pre peritoneal space and this is a very floppy loose peritoneum it requires to be stabilized from the left hand otherwise it will not be it will, the needle will not take the bite easily so this will require little experience but this opening in the indirect sac should be completely closed to avoid migration of the small intestine into the pre peritoneal area and you will get excellent results in the post stop sometimes you can get an unusually large lipoma lipomas are to be reduced in all hernias direct indirect hernias but sometimes an unusually large lipoma will force you a very careful dissection because these lipomas are clearly are closely adherent to the gonadal vessel you can see the gonadal vessel becoming tortuous but the entire lipoma should be carefully and completely removed the limitation of laparoscopic hernia surgery is the cost because of the use of stapler you can completely avoid the stapler by using suturing techniques the mesh has been placed we use non absorbable sutures three sutures are placed upper lateral corner upper middle corner and at the pubic tubercle these non absorbable sutures will keep the mesh in place without the use of tacker they are even less painful than the tacks and then you close the peritoneum over the sac and you don't need to use the tacker so that's the final results one two and three sutures to keep the mesh in place coming about talking about the recurrent inguinal hernias recurrent inguinal hernias if you do repeat open sometimes uh, earlier we used to do ocidectomy for recurrences but they are a different diff uh, difficult procedures multi recurrences increase the cost and they you know increase the hospital stay of the patient if the patient has a recurrent hernia after a laparoscopic repair then you should go anteriorly and do an anterior repair if the recurrence is after an anterior repair then posterior field is virgin field there's healthy tissue 
and then you should do a posterior repair. So if the hernia is recurred on one side, you operate from the other side, that is the dictum. So to conclude, uh, Chairman Sir, the surgical pearls for laparoscopic inguinal hernia repair are anatomy is the key to good laparoscopic hernia repair. That's the primary requirement that person should understand the anatomy. And it's not just a basic anatomy, but a thorough, detailed knowledge of the anatomy of the groin area from the inside. And for that, you also need to have proper training to overcome the learning curve. So anatomy and learning curve, they basically form the basic of laparoscopic inguinal hernia repair. While you are raising the flap, dissecting the flap, make sure that you keep the inferior epigastric vessels anteriorly. They should not fall back. Stay posterior to the inferior epigastric vessel. Otherwise, your repair is going to be extremely difficult when the vessels fall back. Do a careful dissection of the corona mortis to avoid bleeding, which will spoil all your field. Expose always the femoral vein to ensure that you are not missing a femoral hernia. Never dissect in the floor of the triangle of doom. You know, just identify those structures and remain anterior to it. Remember, laparoscopic inguinal hernia repair is parietalization of the cord. So you do not have to go posterior to the cord. Avoid an overzealous separation of the fascia from the swas muscle to decrease the chances or, or eliminate the chances of neuralgia. An adequate dissection of placing a large 17 by 12 centimeter mesh in all patients, whether small or large hernia. The mesh should be a see-through mesh. It should be a heavy proline mesh, 80 grams per meter square, no slit. The corners are rounded, widely overlap, and for a direct hernia, cross the midline for the dissection, as well as uh, uh, for, uh, by of, uh, putting the mesh adequately fixed with minimum number of tacks and proper reparatalization of the area. Laparoscopic anatomy of the groin is very complex. The potential for complications are high. It's an advanced laparoscopic surgery. And I again reiterate, it needs proper training, proper proctoring during the initial phase of experience. It's always good to, for two surgeons to join and do the surgery or you get proctored today. It is possible that at the same time, you can be proctored by a remote proctor who can guide you during the initial surgery phase. If you're not prepared, you can land up into very serious, irreversible trouble out of which you might find it very difficult to come out. And to repeat again, complications in laparoscopic hernia repair are a reflection of the learning curve and patient selection and are not inherent to the technique. A team is many hands and one mind. And that's my team of minimal access bariatric and GI surgery at Fortis Memorial Institute, Gurga. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, sir. Really enjoyed your talk with the, so many practical points in the given 20 minutes. Uh, over to President for a couple of uh, questions and we'll move on to the next topic. Excellent uh, lecture, uh, Dr. Kriplani, as always, and uh, very good points you brought out. Uh, selection of the patient and anatomy is very important. Also fixing the sac anteriorly and not onto the Cooper's ligament and the way the uh, I mean separating the vas from the sac and not sac from the vas. I mean these are all the points they are not written in the books but that uh, you have mastered over a period of uh, so many years experience and uh, every time you come out with new points and I'm so happy that today also uh, we learned a lot of new things so wonderful lecture thank you so much Thank you, President. Thank sir. you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. If you could stop sharing, then we'll move on to viewers. We are now moving to the our next talk of this uh, hernia unlimited program today, where we are going to have uh, three hours of non-stop uh, excellence from all the experts in the field. Next comes Dr. Rajesh Kuller, who all you know is uh, another great trainer, now a director at Max Institute in Delhi, and he has traveled breadth and of the country teaching the art of this TEP program. People know he has been a president of Aussie, HSI, and also honorary secretary IAGS. He authored the book along with the Professor Chavi and his friends on endohernia repair. And also he worked immensely on the first edition of minimal access guidelines. Soon we are going to come out with the, the second edition in a matter of few days. And over to Dr. Kula to tell all the tips and tricks of doing a laparoscopic inguinal hernia in 
step fashion over to you sir thank you very much uh, ishwamurthy and i thank uh, dr sunil popat and the whole team of iajs for giving me this opportunity to present uh, tep repair at this uh, great forum which has been the brain wave of uh, dr sunil popat and other top uh, bearers uh, in the iajs in this difficult time of covid i bring greetings from max institute of laparoscopic endoscopic bariatric surgery max healthcare now every laparoscopic surgeon should learn to do laparoscopic inguinal hernia the reason being that it definitely has much more advantages as compared to the open hernia repair especially in young adults especially in women especially in bilateral hernias because in all these cases it gives much better results as compared to the open hernia in terms of early return to work as well as less chronic growing pain but everyone every surgeon is not able to do or doesn't do a laparoscopic repair in one of our hernia society of india survey conferences uh, we had this questionnaire and we found that only 29% of laparoscopic surgeons perform laparoscopic hernia repair tep or tapb and 32% of surgeons said that they attempted doing the laparoscopic repair of inguinal hernia and discontinued and the different reasons for discontinuing was the higher cost difficult anatomy difficult surgery and possibility of major vascular injuries if you notice these different causes the cost is something which is yes definitely slightly higher than the open surgery but more important is the difficult anatomy and difficult surgery which can be taken over or can be dealt with by proper training and proctoring of young surgeon which is the most important thing in preventing complications and injury to the major vascular structures so that is where the role of uh, society like iagas and hsi comes into play and i must Uh, congratulate iagas for taking this initiative of teaching and training the young surgeons now from normal stage to getting at the stage where you are able to do a successful uh, laparoscopic uh, inguinal hernia repair you need a lot of training and proctoring during early experience standardize the technique and most important is that you must know your limitations if you find it too difficult please don't do it please continue doing anterior repair open surgical repair no harm done but very important is to get proper training and then only continue doing this surgery so that you don't harm the patient now why anatomy is so difficult and the procedure is so difficult because in laparoscopic inguinal hernia there is no similarity to the open inguinal hernia repair done because in open hernia we are looking from outside in whereas in laparoscopic hernia we are looking from inside out the view is from the umbilical area that is the difference you see totally a different anatomy i thank dr uh, kriplani for giving the excellent uh, knowledge about anatomy of this area and putting a lot of stress on understanding and knowing anatomy before one embarks on doing the laparoscopic inguinal hernia repair this is the anatomy which you see if you look from umbilicus towards the pelvic area you have the urinary bladder in the midline you have the uricus going up from the bladder which forms the median umbilical ligament and then you have two more ridges lateral to the median umbilical ligament which are the medial umbilical ligament which are the obliterated umbilical artery and then you have two lateral uh, ridges which are formed by the uh, inferior epigastric artery which are the lateral umbilical ligaments you don't see any any uh, uh, iliopubic tract or conjoint tendon in this area because you are looking from inside out and the importance of 
having a good repair and preventing recurrence, we now understand the importance of myopectineal orifice of Foucault, which is medially bounded by rectus abdominis, laterally by iliosoas, superiorly by conjoint tendon, and inferiorly by pectin pubis. If you want to reduce the recurrence, you must completely and widely cover this myopectineal orifice so that you take care of all possible weak areas in the lower abdominal wall, which is the area of direct inguinal hernia, the area of indirect inguinal hernia, area of femoral hernia, the obturator hernia. This whole area has to be covered with the mesh to prevent recurrence in these cases. Now, what you saw before was the anatomy which you see from inside. But what actually you have to understand is the anatomy behind this peritoneum because the mesh is to be placed in the preperitoneal space. In inguinal area, it is not possible to put the mesh inside the peritoneum. So we have to go into the preperitoneal space and then put the mesh there. So once we bring the peritoneum down, these are the important structure which you must familiarize yourself before you embark on doing an inguinal hernia repair by laparoscopy. This is the pubic bone, this is the pubic symphysis, and this is the pubic bone with the Cooper ligament on it. You see the inferior epigastric artery running on the anterior abdominal wall. Medial to that is the weak area, this is the direct hernia area, and lateral to that is the deep ring, which is the area of indirect hernia. Through the deep ring, you have the cord structures, the testicular vessels, and the vas deferens. And behind the pubic bone, you have the space of rigidus or the retropubic space where the bladder lies. Now you have to, and laterally you have the psoas muscle. You must keep in mind the presence of iliac vessels, which are just at a deeper plane than the cord structures. Now, all this anatomy is very important to which you have to familiarize because until you get this view, you should not be putting the mesh because if this view is not there, it means your dissection is not complete. So, we have medially the space of rigidus and laterally we have the space of bogros and Another important thing is the triangle of doom as uh, emphasized by the Professor Triplani also. These are the areas where one has to be very careful in the beginning. This is the right side, that's the testicular vessel. This is the vas deferens, and this is the reflected peritoneum. So this area, this triangle is important because there lies the great vessels, the iliac artery and iliac vein and the femoral nerve. This is the pubic bone. So, no dissection is to be done at the base of the triangle of doom to avoid injury to the great vessels. Another, as stressed by Dr. Kriplani, is this aberrant obturator, which, is a, which can be a big vein in some cases, uh, which is also called the Bendevait circle or the circle of death. Any injury in this area can be catastrophic. So, you have to be very care careful and aware of these anatomical variations to prevent injury in this area. Laterally, you have the nerves. One of the problems in open inguinal hernia repair is the chronic groin pain. And many patients suffer. And one of the biggest advantage of laparoscopic repair hernia repair is that the incidence of chronic groin pain is much less after laparoscopic inguinal hernia repair. But in this case also, in this area, you must keep in mind the location and presence of the nerves which are important, the lateral cutaneous nerve of the thigh, which is here, and the genital branch or genital femoral, uh, which travels here. The important thing is that the, there should be a layer of fascia over these nerves so that the mesh doesn't come in direct contact with these nerves to decrease the incidence of chronic groin pain. Now, as I said that you have to access the preperitoneal space. So either you can go, go inside the abdomen and then divide the peritoneum and enter the preperitoneal space as Dr. Kripranli beautifully explained very well. Uh, the other technique is the totally extraperitoneal. 
approach in which you do not enter the abdominal cavity at all and you directly enter into the preperitoneal space now that is possible because preperitoneal space is a potential space between the rectus muscle and transversus fascia anteriorly and peritoneum posteriorly and below the arcuate line we know anatomy that below the arcuate line there is no posterior sheath so if we enter from the um, sub umbilical area into this space in front of the posterior rectus sheath towards the pubic bone we automatically enter into the preperitoneal space now when you start doing inguinal hernia repair you have to keep in mind certain very important aspects you must choose your patient you should not embark on every patient you get and start doing a laparoscopic repair you must choose a patient then pre operative preparation and ergonomics of the surgery pre peritoneal access accessory port placement mastering the anatomy midline and direct hernia sac tackling indirect hernia sac lateral space mesh placement i'll be uh, following these sequence to go through all the points in pp repair now when you get going from open to laparoscopic repair which is a patient which will be suitable in the beginning an elderly male who is thin built and has a right direct incomplete reducible inguinal hernia that is the best uh, hernia case which will be suitable for laparoscopic repair and if the distance between umbilicus and pubic symphysis is more than 15 cm it is more favorable to the surgeon without saying there should be no previous abdominal surgery lower abdominal surgery and the patient should be fit for general anesthesia this would be the ideal patient for a beginner when you have the patient on the table it is important to have the bladder empty in young patients or in most of the patients we ask the patient to pass urine and come on the operating table and if the patient has history of prostatism elderly patient pph in those cases uh, we prefer to put in a foley catheter but we try to avoid catheterization as far as possible second important thing is that the anesthetist should be your friend there should be good relaxation of the muscle because you are going to work in a preperitoneal space which is a small space so the good relaxation give you more space to work with the arms of the patient should be kept on side and the surgeon and the camera person stand opposite on the opposite sides the surgeon stands opposite to the side of hernia he is operating with the assistant surgeon standing either in front or by the side of the surgeon it's better to start with 0 degree and then go on to the 30 degree telescope as you progress in the uh, doing more and more surgery this is how you access the preperitoneal space you uh, give incision on the anterior rectus sheath and take two stay sutures on two cut ends retract the rectus muscle laterally and you see the posterior rectus sheath now the space is in front of this posterior rectus sheath towards the pubic bone and then you put the hasan cannula fix the hasan with these two stay sutures to make your port air tight so that there is no leakage of uh, gas from the port now the initial space can be uh, created by using either balloon which are available in the market or you can prepare balloon yourself by tying two finger stalls of a glove over the tip of a suction cannula and then inflate this is the space which you see as you go in which has been created by the balloon and then you put your two more ports in the midline the second port is about 1 cm above the pubic symphysis and the third port is in between the first and the second port all two three ports in the midline this helps for a two hand dissection from the beginning and these same ports can be used for a bilateral hernia you don't have to make a separate port if you 
have to make a lateral port, then you have to dissect the peritoneum from the anterior abdominal wall, enter into the preperitoneal space, and only then you make the lateral port. This also reduces the incidence of injury to the inferior epigastric vessel. This is how you put in your port in the preperitoneal space. You open up the space which has been created by the balloon and then put first and the second port in the space under vision. Many times when you go in, you don't see the pubic symphysis. Now the tactile feedback of the pubic bone is very important. With your instrument, you try to feel for the pubic bone because that is the first landmark which you must see in the preperitoneal space. With the help of the instrument, you feel and then you see the shining pubic bone and then you open up the space and then you go lateral. When you go lateral, if you, if you are not able to see the Cooper's ligament, it means you are dealing with the direct hernia. And to reduce the direct hernia is very simple, as Dr. Kriplani also said, you push the transversalis fascia away and pull the sac down. The gas in the preperitoneal space helps you to push the transversalis fascia up. In indirect hernia, you have to separate the cord from the sac. Pull the sac medially and push the cord structures away from the sac on the lateral aspect. There are no great vessels in this area. Just as you do it in open surgery, you just keep pushing the cord structures away from the sac till you go all around the sac. You can ligate the sac at this stage and divide the distal sac, leave the distal sac open. If the sac is big, if the sac is small, you can completely reduce the sac. It is always very important to look for lipoma in every case. And you look for lipoma along with the uh, testicular vessels. Sometimes the lipoma can be very big, like in this case. And you have to be very careful because most of the time it is a vascular and you have to differentiate between the lipomas, lipomatous fat and the fat of the cord. Because if you go into the wrong plane, then there could be a lot of bleeding or there could be injury to the testicular vessel. But all lipomas have to be reduced 100% without fail. Because if you leave lipoma, this leads to increased incidence of recurrence as well as it will keep giving patient feeling of having hernia still there. The next step is parietalization of the cord, which means you bring down the peritoneum from the deep ring for about 5 centimeter on the cord structure or till the vas turns medially. Now, you have to be very careful. Do not hold the peritoneum at one place for more than 30 seconds because peritoneum is single cell layer. If you hold it for long, you can injure it and it will rupture the peritoneum and cause pneumoperitoneum. Do not hold the cord structures also. Bring the peritoneum down medially as well as laterally so that your mesh lies comfortably over the psoas laterally and medially it rests, rests on the, in the retropubic space and peritoneum should be brought down till the vas is turning medially. Now, Open up the lateral space between the two layers of transversalis fascia like this. You can see that there is a layer of fascia over the nerves, over the psoas. Then divide the anterior layer of the transversalis fascia to have a good lateral space. The lateral limit is up to the anterior superior iliac spine. And push the peritoneum away from the anterior abdominal wall so that you can place your mesh comfortably. The size of the mesh is, uh, we use minimum 15 by 13 centimeter or 17 by 13 centimeter. And we fold it for easy handling in the small space. Two point fixation, two or three point fixation is very important. 
and asepsis is the most important thing the mesh is taken after the whole dissection is done and the mesh is to be placed only then it is taken from the wrapper and this is how we fold the mesh we put two sutures uh, the 15 centimeter is horizontally and this is the 13 centimeter about 5 centimeter is left open which goes into the retropubic space this is how the mesh goes into the retropubic space between the bladder and the retropubic space and fixed should cross always the midline in direct hernia the midline crosses as dr kiplani said should be around 3 to 4 cm after opening the mesh we prefer to put a lateral tack on the anterior abdominal wall which keeps the mesh in position and doesn't uh, cause rolling of the mesh to reduce the seroma we pull in the pseudo sac either fix it on the cooper's ligament or fix it on the anterior abdominal wall this reduces significantly the incidence of seroma formation now this is the video which you will see to understand the whole procedure very nicely uh, the incision initial incision subumbilical incision starts from midline to one side if it's a bilateral hernia access the preperitoneum from the opposite side of midline s retractor gives you good exposure of the anterior sheath horizontal incision in the anterior sheath and stay sutures in the anterior sheath this makes the port airtight doesn't let the carbon dioxide go into the subcutaneous plane to prevent subcutaneous emphysema once you have two stay sutures retract the rectus muscle laterally and go in front of the posterior sheath towards the pubic bone to open up the space fix the hasan cannula put the two working ports and once you have the medial space using two hand instruments just open up the lateral space with one instrument holding the anterior abdominal wall and other instrument bringing the peritoneum down making sure that the inferior epigastric artery is on the anterior abdominal wall now this is what you see you see the direct hernia and the inferior epigastric artery now pull the hernia down push the transversalis fascia away and as i said this is a vascular plane there is no bleeding in this area the gas in the preperitoneal space helps in this step and that is why the direct hernia is ideal for the surgeons to start surgery with if they want to start doing laparoscopic surgery once the pseudo sac is completely reduced you will be able to see the cooper's ligament clearly like this you have the pubic bone with cooper ligament that's the direct defect in preepigastric artery and this is the iliopectineal line now even in direct hernia it is important to explore the area of indirect hernia that is how you open up the lateral space and this is the triangle of pain showing you the iliopsoas with the nerves over it open up the lateral space laterally up to the anterior superior iliac spine and bring down the peritoneum to parietalize the cord till the vas turns medially and that's the last direct defect to reduce the incidence of seroma pull the pseudo sac and you can fix it over the anterior abdominal wall but make sure you don't injure the inferior epigastric artery while doing this this reduces the seroma as well as it brings down the it supports the posterior wall introduce the mesh through the camera port the mesh crosses the midline and then open up the mesh and after opening the mesh you fix it on the anterior bone wall laterally and in a bilateral repair you put other side mesh also hold the mesh and deseplate
Same thing for a indirect hernia. This is a right side indirect hernia. After the medial space, open up the lateral space with two instruments between the two layers of transversal dysphagia, as explained by Professor Triplani, making sure that the inferior pregastric artery is on the anterior abdominal wall. And then you bring the tissue down on the medial aspect. And as there is no hernia, no direct hernia, the peritoneum will come down. And then lateral to the inferior epigastric artery, you see the sac going through the deep ring. You have to pull the sac down and medially and push the structures away from the sac. Just push the testicular vessels and the wall testicular vessels away from the surface of the sac. Keep advancing on the sac till you go across the sac. This is what we do in open surgery also. We separate the cord structure from the sac like this using a gauze piece. Here you can use either a Maryland or a scissor tip just to separate the cord structures here. And cord structure here consists of only the testicular vessel and vas difference, nothing else. There are no other layers because we are in the preperitoneal space. And once you are across the sac, so you have the cord structures, you have the sac, ligate the sac, or you can divide the sac and close the proximal part of the sac with a loop. But the better would be to ligate the sac because by doing so, you prevent any chance of pneumoperitoneum occurring. Separate the sac from the cord structure proximally as far as possible. Ligate the sac. And then if it's a large sac, you can divide or you can completely pull the sac down. And by doing this, you automatically reduce the incidence of seroma formation. If the peritoneum sac is completely reduced, always open up the sac. Don't leave it closed. Then separate the sac from the cord structures, parietalize the cord. That's the vast difference. And the spermatic cord, the testicular vessels. Never hold the cord structures with any instrument. You just have to separate it out. Always hold the peritoneum for short duration at one place and keep separating the vast difference medially till it turns medially. Laterally, you open up the space between the two layers, swast below with the nerves and divide the anterior layer. Divide the lateral attachment completely so that the mesh lies flat over the psoas muscle and not lifted up. We cut two centimeters of the mesh to make it 15 by 13 centimeter and sutures are placed on the flat surface side of the mesh so that unrolling of the mesh is proper. So lateral part of the mesh goes between the psoas muscle and the peritoneum. Two point fixation medially and after unrolling the mesh, you fix the mesh on the anterior abdominal wall, hold the mesh and desufflate. So the important points take home message for creation of preperitoneal space, you can use balloon or even telescopic dissection, they have almost similar outcome. In TEP repair, we dissect medial to lateral as compared to uh, TAPP where we open the peritoneum laterally. The landmark to be visualized are the pubic bone, Cooper ligament, inferior epigastric vessel, cord structures, myopectineal orifice boundaries, and the fascia over the psoas muscle. Only once these landmarks are clear, you proceed to put in the mesh. Extensive preperitoneal dissection is critical to prevent uprolling of the mesh and preventing of recurrence. The mesh should be at least 15 by 10 centimeter, which is recommended by most of the societies uh, 
but we prefer to put a larger mesh minimum mesh size which we put is 15 by 13 centimeter in large hernia even 17 by 13 centimeter as recommended by professor kriplani an early return to normal activity can safely be recommended after this surgical prepare thank you very much Well, you are dear, yeah, dear viewers, I'm sure you all agree that Kullar it's, uh, is one of his master stroke and uh, giving an excellent video and expertise description of all the steps, 10 steps of uh, TEP procedure. And I'm sure you all enjoyed this uh, video presentation for the last 30 minutes. We have just one minute for a quick questions, if any. I will have just ask if, Rajesh, I'm sure you're very good in TEP, but there are situations where you think it would be better to go for a TAP procedure. Absolutely, we, absolutely. Which are those uh, situations, please uh, highlight those. Uh, uh, you see, there are situations where it's a large hernia, irreducible hernia, in, or uh, you suspect any obstruction, then it is always better to do a diagnostic leptoscopy. You go in, always reduce the hernia under vision. And then once you are inside the peritoneal cavity, then it, it makes sense to do a TAPP repair. Or if you suspect any other associated pathology, then it's always better to do a diagnostic leptoscopy in that case and then proceed on to TAPP repair. So the large irreducible hernia or suspicion of strangulation in which uh, you are not sure about viability of the bowel in the hernia it's better to do uh, a diagnostic laparoscopy, reduce the contents, wash the consent, contents, and then proceed with TAPP. Thank you. Over to President for his remarks. Thank you, Dr. Kullar. Excellent uh, lecture depicting all the steps of TEP. And I have found you one of the best uh, TEP teachers <laughs> in country, like Dr. Kriplani, best TAPP teacher. So friends, uh, uh, we have had uh, two lectures on uh, laparoscopic inguinal hernia repair and uh, we'll move on to now ventral hernias. Ishwar. Yeah. yeah, and now we are uh, having a third in our line, dear viewers, is on ventral hernia I form plus, none other than the third, third batsman for Indian cricket is uh, Virat Kohli. Our Virat Kohli is our president himself coming from Ahmedabad, uh, Niti Hospital, and he is the honorary surgeon for His Excellency Governor of Gujarat, and also honorary professor in GSL Medical College. He has vast interest in the field of uh, minimal access surgery for the last three decades, and not only in GA surgery but also in hernia, bariatric, and also therapeutic endoscopy. Over to you, Professor Sunil Papad, for giving all the tips for a beginner on how to do uh, IPOM Plus. Thank you. Thank you, Ishwar. Is my slide visible? Yeah, it is visible. Okay. So good evening, friends. I bring greetings from Ahmedabad. And uh, today's topic for me is IPOM Plus. Uh, the topic is uh, made uh, uh, very practical for the uh, junior surgeons and colleagues who are in the beginning of their practice of laparoscopic hernia surgery. Uh, today, tonight, we have three topics on left ventral hernia, and uh, uh, we'll have a component separation later on by my friend Ramesh. So, friends, uh, the ventral hernias, as you know, can be umbilical, epigastric, incisional, spigalian. There are a variety of hernias. The first publication came from Carl Leblanc regarding the left ventral hernia repair. And since then, the popularity of this surgery has increased like anything. As you are aware, the etiological factors for ventral hernia is mostly due to failure of the facial tissues to heal and the close, and promoted by inhibition of the wound healing. It, ventral hernia can happen in up to 20% of the laparotomies, and the highest incidence is with the most common incision, the midline incision. These are the other risk factors like obesity, diabetes, steroids, ascites, portal hypertension, malnutrition, and wound infection. One of the most important risk factors is the poor technique of uh, abdominal 
incision closer. And so nowadays in all our hernia workshop and hernia fellowship courses, uh, we have a special lecture devoted to how to close the abdominal incisions. This is uh, one very useful classification, the European Hernia Society classification of uh, incisional hernias, mental hernias. Basically, all the midline hernias, they started from the top, from the cranial aspect down to the bottom, the caudal most aspect, and divided into five subcategories like M1, which is the subzephoidal, M2, which is epigastric, M3, which is umbilical, M4 is infraumbilical and M5 suprapubic. The lateral hernias are divided into four subcategories L1 subcostal, L2 flank, L3 iliac cosa, and L4 lumbar hernias lateral to the anterior axillary line. So I'll be concentrating mostly on the uh, midline hernias. It is also classified that uh, the length of the hernia should always be measured craniocaudally and the width of the hernia should always be measured horizontally, left to right. So it gives an uniformity. So if you include all these uh, factors, then you can classify an incisional hernia like uh, M1 to M5 if it is in midline or lateral L1 to L4. If it is recurrent, you say yes or no, and then length of the defect, width of the defect, and again the width is subclassified less than four centimeter W1, four to ten centimeter W2, and more than ten centimeter W3. This is a very practical classification, and if it is made a habit to use it, then it will definitely help in a future uh, review of the literature and review of your own data and coming out with some publication. So the indication for surgery for hernia is a pain, the swelling which is increasing in the size. There can be signs of uh, obstruction or irreducibility like pain, vomiting, constipation, obstipation. And sometimes the patient comes for surgery straight away as soon as the patient sees the hernia. The contraindications are when there is a huge, when there is a large abdominal wall defect. This large can be subjective because an eight centimeter defect can be, we can be able to close the defect in a very large abdomen. And whereas a six centimeter defect, we may not be able to close it in a very small abdomen. So subject to the size of the abdomen, uh, the defect, can be classified as large, but in our practice, anything above six to eight centimeter would require some form of uh, relaxation or component separation, depending on the size of the abdomen. When there is a loss of domain, obviously it's a contraindication for IPOM plus. Presence of abdominal skin grafts or fistulas, that also forms the uh, contraindication. When, they, when you see a large hernia, preoperative CT scan gives you the maximum information. Mechanical bulb preparation is not mandatory in all the cases. Very selective cases, we use it. The advantages of laparoscopic ventral hernia repair, there is a less excess trauma, small cars and better cosmosis, less soft tissue dissection, identification of hernia is very easy, like switches, defects, and so taking care of the uh, multiple defects at the same time, which ultimately will reduce the recurrence, decrease wound complications because the wound size has decreased so much and less morbidity. Why IPOM plus? So basically we all started doing the bridging repair in the form of IPOM in which we were uh, dissecting and then clo closing the defect with the mesh. Then from 2009 onwards, we started doing the IPOM plus where we close the defect and then put an intraperitoneal only mesh because there is reduced chance of seroma formation. There's no mass eventration, less recurrences, better restoration of abdominal wall function and improved long-term outcomes. 
the steps of the surgery we give general anesthesia to the patient right tip is always placed urinary catheter supine position with arms by the side of the patient the initial access can be by varis needle or uh, open method or optiview trocar then the additional trocar and the reason we do the adhesiolysis we do the defect closure and then we put in the mesh and fix in the mesh so this has the same criteria also advised by sages and they also suggested that varis needle open hassan technique or optical trocar entry may all be done safely for primary port placement secondary ports always under the vision adhesiolysis and with limited use of the energy adhesiolysis should include the entire previous incision and jo not just the part of the defect because you may find some other defect in other areas falciform and umbilical ligaments taken down if they are nearby this is most important that surgeons should inspect the bowel after adhesiolysis for inadvertent enterotomy because if you don't look for it you may not find it this is how we use uh, three ports in most of the cases for a midline incisional ventral hernias and if you have such a large hernia large ventral hernia then you can still do ipom plus hybrid technique in which some of the irreducible contents you can take out from the skin and the excess skin also you can excise and close it and then put the intraperitoneal only mesh always measure and document the size of the hernia defect defect closer though no level one evidence however there are decreased seroma possibly decreased recurrence improved abdominal wall function and improved abdominal wall control because of the defect closure 5 cm overlap on all the sides the mesh fixation should be appropriate for the size and location of the defect larger the defect stronger the fixation and if you are operating on a supra pubic hernia then fixation should be to symphysis pubis or cupus ligam just like what we show in tapp and tep also what is important what we are doing in practice for the mesh fixation double crowning technique and also transfacial sutures i'll show you a short video with all the steps so this is a patient who has come in with multiple defects in the midline epigastric and umbilical and her ventral hernia so we reduce the contents there are if there are any adhesions we do the adhesiolysis always make sure there is no bowel then only use the energy source if there is any chance of bowel we use the cold scissors for the adhesiolysis one has to be very careful while doing adhesiolysis stitches simultaneously omentum is a very vascular organ and if there is even if there is a small bleeder at the end of the surgery you will see that it's a lot of bleeding in the peritoneal cavity then the falciform ligament should always be separated away at least for 5 cm from the defect better to keep it away 6 to 7 cm so you have very good space available for the mesh fixation and harmonic scalpel is very helpful in division of uh, this fatty structures here the umbilical hernia is a recurrent hernia as you can see the previous surgery was done by open technique and uh, there are prolin stitches visible the umbilical ligament is divided here so that all the fat goes away and your mesh lies on the muscular part so it is very important if the mesh is lying on the fat the fixation won't be that good and there are chances of recurrence 
for closing of the defect we are just taking out the taking the peritoneum away and now we are closing the defect this is a non barbed uh, regular proline material but you can use a barbed suture also barb suture a little bit more costly as compared to the regular proline and one has to learn and master the procedure of intracorporeal suturing and knotting to do the laparoscopic ventral hernia repairs once the defect is closed it is ready for the mesh then we measure the mesh size as per the defect size and uh, we always use the transfacial stitches this particular mesh was not available with transfacial stitch so we have taken some transfacial stitches position it and then transfacial stitch with this uh, uh, needle you pull it up and you can see that it is covering the entire defect so normally we use four transfacial stitches at 12 3 6 and 9 o'clock position and these stitches are taken with a vicryl or pds material then we fix the mesh with the help of uh, absorbable tackers and that is done in the double crowning so that we fix the mesh of the border with a 2 cm gap in between the tacks and then the inner circle around the defect again with 1 to 2 cm margin depending on the size of the defect and that is the completion of the hernia surgery sometimes you can see so much of fat into the peritoneal cavity and uh, here you can see lot of extra peritoneal fat causing the umbilical hernia and fat all across all around i'll not play the video but i uh, just want to highlight that it, there is so much of fat you need to take away the fat for the better fixation of the uh, mesh so how to handle the mesh to reduce the infection the mesh should be handled aseptically always chain the gloves before touching the mesh use sterile instruments and not hands to handle the mesh as much as possible avoid contact between mesh and skin avoid excessive use of the electrocautery to reduce the chances of infection place all the ports as far away as possible from the defect so you have good area available for the maneuverability of the instruments particularly the tacker switch scope position as necessary keep intra abdominal pressure high during dissection and low during defect closure and mesh fixation and very importantly handle the mesh properly so this is this is a list of complication many of this uh, complication will be discussing in the panel discussion i will highlight upon the few ones the fixation of the mesh while doing the fixation take caution avoid injuries to the epigastric vessels peripheral nerves ureters retroperitoneal vascular structures if there is a persistent pain after laparoscopic ventral hernia repair normally treated with analgesics and anti inflammatory medications rarely requires steroids or some injection nerve block etc it's not that common seroma management asymptomatic seromas observed only persistently symptomatic seromas may be aspirated under sterile conditions recurrent symptomatic seromas should be treated with surgical drainage and if possible excision of the serosa lining i was that again is very rarely required most common way of treatment of seroma is proper counseling of the patient and masterly observation post operative ileus low incidence after laparoscopic ventral hernia repair conservative treatment if there is a intra operative enterotomy then take extreme caution 
tailored approach based upon the operative finding, degree of contamination, surgeon experience, patient interest, pre-operative counseling. So if you are at the beginning of your career, and if you come across intraoperative enterotomy, then call for help, call a senior colleague. And if no senior colleague available, you may have to convert to open, deal with the enterotomy, and may do the mesh repair later on. If there is a delayed enterotomy following laparoscopic ventral near repair, obviously it would require emergency operation, bowel repair, resection, and or GI tract diversion, and removal of the mesh if uh, in the enterotomy patients. Surgical site infections are much less following laparoscopic ventral near repair. Very rarely you come across the cellulitis and severe mesh infection that would require a whole lot of measures like antibiotics and percutaneous drainage, wound debridement, negative pressure wound management, and mesh excision. Thank you, friends. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, uh, for, the, for this opportunity. And I welcome all of you to IGS 2022 from 9 to 12 June at Raj Mundri, and we look forward to seeing you. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you, President, for that uh, concise, uh, excellent presentation on uh, all the tips for IPOM Plus. Any questions from our panel of faculties here, Dr. Ajay Shah, Rajesh Kular, Ramesh, one couple of questions allowed because we have uh, five minutes more in his allotted time. And I have a question quickly is, uh, what is your choice of composite mess and why? Uh, so, yeah, so very good question for uh, IPOM plus, IPOM and all laparoscopic ventronia repair, we use composite mesh. Mostly it is a question of availability and what you are good at it. In most of our cases, we are using the Paritex mesh uh, because it is uh, something we are using for so many years and we are used to it. However, we have also started using other companies mesh like what I showed went up went up like mesh and uh, all the meshes are basically coming with a non-absorbable polypropylene or polyester with an absorbable layer of cellulose so the absorbable layer goes towards the intestine and the non-absorbable layer goes towards the paritis it is of utmost important because some of sometimes we have seen the complication of uh, hernia and mesh occurring because the mesh is implanted reverse in reverse direction. The absorbable part has been fixed to the paritis and non-absorbable part is left exposed to the intestine. So this care has to be taken to avoid uh, some small mistakes which can lead to major complication. Dr. Kriplani. Wonderful uh, lecture, Sunil. Really enjoyed it thoroughly, and uh, you know some of the very minor points have been highlighted so so uh, clearly. Is there any size you think is optimal for IPOM Plus? Which I mean, below a certain size, you think that IPOM Plus will be as good as IPOM alone, and above certain size, where you think IPOM Plus may not be effective, and you give way to certain other abdominal reconstructive procedures. So, what is the optimal? Yeah. So very good point, uh, Dr. Kriplani. Uh, when we were doing IPOM initially, we were bridging all the defects. When we moved over to IPOM Plus, we started suturing all the defects. However, less than two centimeter size defect, it is okay if you don't close. But now we have made a habit of closing all the defects. So everybody in the team is used to closing the defect. and. Uh, if any defect is more than eight centimeters, not, not what you practice, your recommendations. To the yeah. Okay. If there is any defect more than eight centimeter, definitely in majority of the patient, it would require some sort of uh, component separation. And the lower size below which you will not close, it's, you will not recommend close. Uh, I would uh, close all the defects. Okay. Right. What about you? Yeah, I mean, less than three centimeters defect, we do not close because it adds to pain. But, but less than three centimeter, would you do IPOM? Yeah, three mm -hmm. centimeters is the lowest size we do IPOM. To two centimeters, we do an open Mayo's procedure. About two centimeters to you know eight centimeters, depending upon the flexibility of the abdominal muscles, we sometimes go up to nine centimeters IPOM plus. 
and about that we do you know component separation so that's a... centimeters we do laparoscopy repair below two centimeters we do not so again, uh, it's a different viewpoint uh, you brought out, Dr. Kriplani, and uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, we have made it a practice to close all the defects so that uh, you know everybody is tuned to the procedure. And uh, you know, pain-wise, uh, I think uh, whenever we close the defect, even less than say two centimeter, one centimeter, or three centimeter, one centimeter hardly comes to us because mostly. The smallest defect we see in lap hernia repair is uh, 2 to 2.5 to 3 centimeter size. So we have not seen uh, any increased pain following this uh, IPOM Plus. But I uh, agree to your viewpoint because uh, you have been doing this surgery for more than 20 years. And uh, uh, like everybody else, uh, people started putting a bridging repair and then moved over to the uh, closer of the defect and then uh, restoring the. Uh, then reinforcing it with the mesh. Uh, Ramesh, uh, you wanted to say something. Yeah, I think uh, Ajay, if people have a uh, big hernias, for example, there was a time when people used to do only IPOM, correct? Even for a say seven centimeter, eight centimeter defect, and those are the patients who actually came back to us. So I think we have become wiser in closing the defect, and I am with Sunil in saying that every defect has to be closed. So if it is a less than two centimeter, I would do a suture repair where I will close the defect. Or I'll put that umbilical patch on the top where I'm going to close the defect. And if it is an IPOM, I'm going to close the defect. And if it's a component separation, I'm again going to close the defect. So it is basically a closure of the ventral uh, and making the intact abdominal wall becomes a very important part of hernia surgery. When I say less than two centimeters, we do not, you know, we do not do laparoscopic repair because perhaps cost-wise, it is not prudent. Correct. You, uh, so you do a two centimeter defect by laparoscopy, and you get equally good repairs by a Mayo's imbrication operation, which is a time tested standard procedure. And where again the defect is closed in Mayo's. No, it is imbrication. So not only closed, it is a double breasting. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about only laparoscopic procedure that below certain size you will not you will not close. I mean, up to three centimeter size, we two to three centimeter size we do not close uh, because you know we don't think that either it adds to uh, recurrence or seroma or either it gives a benefit to recurrence or seroma or cosmesis also because three centimeter defect is hardly any defect in which abdominal muscles will be bulging unless there is an associated divarication i mean if there's a divarication associated with a smaller defect then obviously you have to bring down the divarication laparoscopically and push the mesh over it but then you're closing for divarication and not for three centimeter defect but about three centimeters we always close the defect what about a small umbilical hernia? Can we consider doing something like a top procedure? Just to raise the peritoneal flap with the proline mesh. Is it yeah, advisable yeah. or is it a recommended standard of care or is it a it's not something a, needs? It's not a recognized standard of care, but it, it is doable and many people are still doing it because putting in a, the specialized meshes for a IPOM plus and left ventral hernia, they're very expensive. So the, we Indian surgeons have always done the modification and they, they are now accepted worldwide that you can do intraperitoneal uh, TAPP and take care of the smaller hernias. And the same is being done in now ETAP and all that thing that uh, you go retrorectus and put in the mesh. So I think uh, it is a good technique to learn for uh, smaller hernias. Like laparoscopy, TAPP repair for small primary ventral hernias. I would specifically yeah. say primary ventral hernia is a wonderful technique. You have a central portion of the peritoneum where there's excessive fat laden peritoneum in the midline around the, uh, uh, around the falciform ligament. And uh, you can raise the flap, a thin peritoneal flap, not involving the posterior rectus sheet. So basically you are working in a plane between the peritoneum and the posterior rectus sheet without damaging the posterior rectus sheet. For a small three to four centimeters defect, you can create enough space for a 15 into 15 centimeter proline mesh. You drastically decrease the cost and you also drastically decrease the number of tags that you're going to place because the peritoneum supports the mesh. So, you know, they decrease the tax not to decrease the cost, but to decrease the pain in the post operative period because pain is directly dependent on the number of tags you put during an ingual hernia repair. And we have been practicing it for almost 15 years. 
but you have to be very selective in these patients because the technique depends upon the availability of fat in the preperitoneal space male patients have more fat in the preperitoneal space obese patients have more fat in the preperitoneal space with a thin female you may not find a good plane and you will land up in tearing the peritoneal cavity and not being able to put the mesh so if you select proper cases you can raise a peritoneal flap and you can do a ipom plus using a proline mesh significantly decreases the cost and the pain thank you thank you i think that takes to our fourth lecture of today one yet another way of cost effective manager of pendle hernia to see that procedure and also to listen to our dr seva kumar i call him the surya kumar of our cricket indian cricket you have to come with me to kanyakumari there is small little town called ithamuli where he silently practices what i call a patient centered care because of the demand from the patient for a cost effective care he has been toiling there day and night while we are all sleeping night time he is operating as an innovative surgeon in endoscopic thyroidectomy now he is going to describe yet another procedure scola i am sure uh, and uh, recently in the last couple of months ago he had one of the largest congregation of hernia surgeons across the country with uh, close to 250 delegates were attending the conference looks like a mini Uh, i mean mid term conference as far well as i age is concerned in my opinion and uh, i think we always appreciate his ability humility and humanity in the way he does things over to siva to share the screen and give her views on the scola and its uh, technical tips unmute yourself siva start sharing the screen thank you very much for your support so good evening respected seniors and my dear colleagues and my dear friends glad to be a part of this iags prime time and thanks everyone for giving me this opportunity to present in front of you all the legend in the field of laparoscopic surgery the topic which today i am Yes, yeah. sir. You can see your minimal slides. access technique for the diverticulation of rectus with umbilical cord. It's not only for the diverticulation of rectus or umbilical cord. You can do it for the even for the umbilical cord also, like umbilical cord alone also. But which I'm going to show is a scholar, which is already established technique by the uh, Western people. Where they do the technique by little bit different is there like between the scola original scola technique and the my technique my way of technique how i am going to do the scola technique here normally the patient when is coming with a small umbilical hernia with the diverticulation of rectus where the patient is selected for the surgeries like or my surgeries like maybe the patient will be coming with the surge like surgeries because for the cosmetic purpose means mostly the patients not with the obstruction because of the diverticulation if the patient is having a huge hernia they will come for the hernia surgery here the scola it is called subcutaneous only mesh laparoscopic approach this i'll uh, say the approach is i can say this is a augmentation also for the ventral hernia of rectus abdominis this is like we have uh, so many way of keeping a mesh like on lay in lay shut lay under lay topic to mesh there is a uh, different types and different types are already discussed like what we talked about the tap tap i pom i pom plus we have a e tap for large intraoscopic hernia and like uh, e milas and milas and tom there is a trans abdominal retromuscular repair by our own member like our uh, executive member as uh, like uh, mashurka create a new technique it's a trans abdominal retromuscular repair and we have the anterior component and posterior component separation that is a double incoming cwr which is going to be talk with a pramesh so we have the so many technique for the hernias now now just now we discuss about the cost factor and we discuss the newer technique of like uh, keeping a uh, why we cannot keep the proline mesh 
under the peritoneum. This is a different thought process of the, our surgeon, how we are going on creating a newer technique for small hernia, which was like, so contraindicated like, contra by like, our people, how we can do a hernia surgery by laparoscopy. Today, we have the, like it's maybe made as, this is a standard technique. And like we everybody started following a technique and we started creating a new new technique, each and everything. It's a small, small different techniques. So in a scholar, how what how I am going to do this scholar technique here? This it's a general anesthesia, low lithotomy or like spread position, whichever we can take in this is this uh scholar OT, OT layout. The surgeon will be standing in like in between the legs of the patient. The camera person will be standing in left of the surgeon and stirrup nerve will be right of the patient and the monitor in front of the head. So the port placement, the different here is the squaring scholar, is the best friend, the Western type of pe Western people and me is the different between the uh, incision is different here. How the, normally the scholar is made is, is like the supra-bibic incision. That is around like three to four centimeter incision made in the low, like the suprabibic region. There, then with the balloon or the hand, the like below the subcutaneous pain in the uh, facial scarpa and later, like they create the pain with the hand or balloon and they create the pain. Then they will put the port the boat. Here, what I'm going to do is like I'm not creating a four, four centimeter or three centimeter incision. Just I'm creating a 10 mm camera port in suprabibic region. And 5 mm working board on right side and left side of the iliac fossa. So, like, we'll go to the procedure here. So, we can see how, like, uh, this is a suprabibic, this is a suprabibic incision. It's a 10 millimeter, that is one centimeter incision, which is made then in a subcutaneous pain, like with your retractor, you go and see the rectus muscle, like, here, rectus muscle down. Then insert the obliquid drucker. That's like we have the call source, we have the obliquid drucker. Insert the obliquid drucker in such a way, just slide above the rectus muscle. Then you'll be reaching the above the rectus below the subcutaneous plane. Then start like keeping a pressure around somewhere 15 to 16 because we are not inside the intra abdominal. Keeping the pressure on around 15 to 16, create a plane in a subcutaneous plane. Like how you are doing an open surgery, just like duplicating the open surgery here into the laparoscopic surgery, you are creating a flap where from suprabibic region to the scaphoids of sternum, so up to scaphoid process of sternum, up to the sub subcostal margin. Like how much, like how many centimeter width you are going to take? Around 15 centimeter. Like you have to, like you can do so many things. Like you can. Uh, like uh, do the pre preoperatively mark the rectus by the uh, like ultrasound technique and other technique, or in, say, going inside and you can see the rectus muscle when you are dissecting, doing the subcutaneous dissection, you are rising the flap. You can see here, this is a small like umbilical hernia, which I am pulling on the left side, like uh, this umbilical tube, which you are seeing here. It's a small thing, it's not, a, it's not an indicator for this patient, but like. The divergation is the problem for this patient here. So, like now I am disconnecting the umbilical tube here. Like sometimes this is a small hernia. This is must my first surgery, first hernia surgery, which I did. This is a, which I am doing in front of, like uh, just presenting in front of you. You can see now from outside, I'm just putting my finger and pressuring, pressuring, like there is a stiffy sternum. Like there, from there, I initially I used to take a yeah, two ethylon, that is a two ethylon double loop, like uh, two, like there is a two uh, layer of two ropes, like which I'm taking from the system, start the suturing from to or a nearby, that is augmentation of the rectus, that is creating the linear alpha, the new linear alpha. So, like initially, which this is the because long uh, ethylon will be coming around like uh, it's uh, more than 100, like 83 centimeter. So, what we used to do, keep the length of the suture outside, uh, outside the skin. So, taking 
in the needle inside will be starting the suturing and plicating the anterior rectus rectus c so the rectus muscle is going to come into the center now so this is the thing like how we are going to complete the surgery like how we are going to complete the suturing this is a, because of the suturing technique the western people started opening down for like suturing complete completion of the suturing as well as after fishing the mesh also completion of suturing here how we are going to complete the suturing just we'll see so as this uh, ethylon loop ethylon after coming like nearby the pubic symphysis like a gynecologist how they take a loop and do the open surgery how they uh, suture knotting suturing knotting the same technique inside the loop i rotate the needle and take the complete the fighting fight here suturing here so the augmentation is complete you can see the how the rectus is like linear alpha is created in the center so like i completed in the caudal part now how like a sub sub how i am going to complete the suture in the cranial part and just taking one more bite there now pulling out of the excess suture which was which was present outside and doing the knotting and suturing in the in the endo sutures so this complete the augmentation you can see like just i am cutting the excess thread outside so this will complete the suturing of the like uh, augmentation of the rectus that is a uh, creating a linear alpha. now how how we are going to give the second support to this muscle taking a 30 cm mesh cutting into the 15 into 30 near from like say if it's done to pubic symphysis just keeping as a tunnel creating a tunnel and now fixing the mesh taking a 20 ethylon or rolling or i we can use a pds suture taking a continuous suture from the right end of the corner even here i didn't take the suture inside from cranial to caudal coming down on the right side then in the left side just i'm using a right left hand like we can use the right hand also however you are comfortable let's make the surgeon easier so here the come after this is the problem in original scholar the completing of the suture they use the outside technique like they suture from outside with the hand with the incision which is they made in a proper picture here we complete on the same port position maybe like i'll be changing the 5 mm port with the camera and like 10 mm port for like with the reducer i'll be using for a suture so this is going to complete the procedure here now what we do always in the open surgery there is a chance of serum formation because you have created a such a huge subcutaneous plane like a flap so what i'm going to do is keeping the same both the port right leg post and left leg post of 5 mm port through 5 mm port keep the vacuum prime inside and 
give the compression afterwards. So this is going to complete the scholar. This is the first case. That was the first case which was I was with. This is the second, like this is afterwards, I change over to now, like there is a suture material, like the surgeon friendly suture materials are available. Like with the lock, we can use uh, V-lock sutures. There is a rolling V-lock sutures are available. We can here, we can do in a two layer, like instead of like there, I usually, initially I was doing in a single layer. Here I started doing in a two layer. One layer first, then again, from, from starting from the upside, like down, like second layer. So it's again giving, going to be the strengthening to the midline. And it's only problem when you are coming by nearby your camera. That can be changed over by your scope, like to 5mm scope or even 10mm scope, your camera, so your camera person is going to be the good enough. He can retract the port nearby you and show the camera, you can complete the suture. So that is the first layer, which I'm going to complete. Like again, like uh, this, we can take a reverse sutures and do it, but like I usually, I do the looping knotting here. So this is the first layer is completed. Then again, the second layer, which I'm going to start from there. So this can even, now initially I used to mark the, both the border of the rectus for the good augmentation. When like uh, in initial stages. Now you can visualize where the rectus muscle on, when you, you can see here, like uh, there, there is a, uh, like I use a methylene blue for the marking the rectus, which is, which came in the midline here. So, which was I was doing initially. Now, also I, do, I used to do some cases, but other cases we can see like in a practice it comes on the rectus muscles. We can see the rectus muscles and the divagation of recti and the margin of the rectus muscle. So, we can take a suture. So, this is going to complete the second layer where I'm just completing the going to complete the second layer. So. After this, like uh, even initially, this like I'm so comfortable now. Again, like uh, I used to get, I used to get some cases, like uh, maybe two or three cases, small skin necrosis, like or ischemia. I used to get. Now, what I started to do is like that uh, video is not available, but I, I think I shown in the uh, here, like the pulse hernia, which has happened here. I started to leave the tributaries, like which is coming, the vessels which is coming to the anterior rectus, like maybe in the side, maybe not in the center, the side, the 15 nearby 15 centimeter, whichever is going to come. I'm just leaving the vessels alone. And whenever I'm taking, like just keeping a mesh, giving a slick on the mesh to adapt the vessels inside. So that's after that, like the results are so good, like there's no skin necrosis also is this happening here. If you are giving, going to give the vacuum, so vacuum as well as the compression corset, the result is going to be excellent. Post-operative outcome, the train removal at the patient discharge on post-operative day, yes, like always the train, like there will be a 180 ml, 150 ml. So after like less than 50 ml, 40 ml, we'll be discharging the patient, taking the moving the train. The advantage, the peritoneal cavity is not open. The virginity of the abdomen is not touched and reducing the infection and vital organ is injuries. The skin sensation is not made which is reducing the morbidity. The umbilicus is retained, physiological wellness and psychological wellness and very minimal post-operative pain, not just hernia correction, rather the anterior wall repair. So the squalor technique is safe, it's reproducible and cost-effective and alternative for the patient with the abdominal wall hernia associated with the diabetes of fat tank. Here, I can I have to put, like I have to, like uh, the scola is C O L A instead of scola, they like uh, my senior members given S K O L A in the 
invitation i was just surprised like uh, surprise or like uh, thing like they changed the name of scola into shivkumar rola <laughs> scola thank you very much it's just for joke but last but not for the least heartfelt gratitude and thanks for the each and every one is this spent time hope you gain knowledge and the technique under this topic with the patient and many thanks to the president and convener and secretary and other executives of this iags group who are doing a wonderful job by conducting this spent time fortnight around 2500 to 3000 people is just watching like uh, this program really is a surprise like this are like uh, more than the international program which we should be proud of for india thank you very much sir thank you thank you thank you shiva i think the all the viewers and the, the faculties here thoroughly enjoyed your uh, uh, work and the ex excellent exposition of your skill in uh, Uh, destruction in the subcutaneous plane, placing the mesh there. I just wonder what energy source you normally use, and uh, initially, and uh, what is your choice now? Because you need to destruct a plane. Initially, really, sir, like uh, I was like uh, worried. I was using the so much, uh, so many like uh, vessel sealer. I was using uh, like uh, I, it, uh, this one, like uh, harmonic scalpel. I was using. Now we can use the. There is a vessel. See, like bipolar vessel sealer like blade coagulation and cutting like there is a great thing is it is available we can use that that give like like same like feel like a harmonic scalpel which will give the result because like we are not going to come across the huge vessels here fine uh, tributaries and vessels are going to come and that also we are not going to disturb now like maybe like in the midline we will be disturbing in the uh, like lateral margin we are not disturbing the vessels now so like i don't think like the very very like uh, harmonic scalpel or like the sealing is must now we can do with a simple bipolar cutting and coagulation the new more pressure what pressure is it required less slightly higher it's, pressure it's, than it's in it's initially sir only for the putting a your first port or the dissection and two 5 mm port that mm -hmm. i use of 16 after that you will get the plane like if you are keeping Tol ten itself it's enough because you'll get like ballooned out of the abdomen. Like the pressure is not enough more than like like eight to ten is enough. Like when okay. you started putting the second post, second post. Thank you. Time for a couple of comments or uh, opinions, Professor Sunil Papad, and then the panel, please. Thank you, thank you, Shiva, for a wonderful uh, procedure and demonstration. I think Ishwar will move on to next lecture immediately, so that yeah. uh, you know it's getting late. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah. Uh, we have viewers. I think we are moving next to uh, Dr. Ramesh Punjani, alumni of Grand Medical College, who has been practicing the art and science of laparoscopy for the last thirty years. I'm sure people traveling in, in the past in the C mass now the M mass. The his way of his way of suturing, teaching, and other things. It's a treat to watch. I'm sure he is going to tell why, when. we do the component separation how it can be done for a clear comprehensive understanding of this complex subject i think we go to dr ramesh punjani he has a moral ethics of how to do he always let his scalpel or his laparoscopy do all the speaking over to you ramesh thank, thank you dr so much for a kind introduction uh, i'll thank uh, sunil dr sunil popal and uh, kanak well to give me this opportunity to be on a IAGS Prime, which is our really a premier program, and uh, <clears throat> I'm going to talk on component separation. I bring greetings from Mumbai. Now, in ventral hernia, if we see, almost 75 to 80 percent of the patients will have this is what is known as M3 hernia, which is approximately it's a W1 hernia, it's less than four centimeter. And as the previous people have said that you know the choice of procedure would be probably an IPOM, or it's a smaller maybe suture repair, maybe a patch plasty by a small umbilical patch but when you have a hernia of this size then definitely this patching of this defect is not going to work what you need is an abdominal wall reconstruction i am going to talk on when are we going why are we going to do it when are we going to do it and how are we going to do it now this is first important part of abdominal wall reconstruction is importance of linea alba now this was a great man august ruber he was a german uh, Uh, embryologist and he actually did a lot of study in studying the human anatomy and he came to a very important conclusion he said that whatever is important in the body is always surrounded by the bony case 
For example, the brain is inside the skull. The air passages are within between the trachea and the cervical vertebra. The lung and the heart are in the thoracic cage, and reproductive organs are in the pelvic ring. But when you see the abdomen, it is the vertebra behind, but in the front there is only a linea alba. And this is what he called the entry abdominal wall as a lacuna skeletized sternopubica. This was the word which was coined by August Ruber. And what he means is the linea alba is a skeleton of the abdominal wall. And what happens now? What is the physiology of this abdominal wall? That actually abdominal wall is like an intact cylinder. So it is a cylinder which is bound by the diaphragm on the top, diaphragm below, the entry abdominal wall and the vertebrae behind. And what does happens when this both the diaphragms contract and when this muscle also contract, that is what we do during a valsalva's maneuver. A lot of positive pressure is generated, but this pressure cannot go behind because of vertebra. And this is how we pass urine, we pass stools, and we also deliver, the lady also delivers a baby. So all these three physiological activities requires an intact abdominal wall. This is first concept of, so therefore you need to, your functions are jeopardized in a large ventral hernia. Now imagine this lady, she has got a large ventral hernia, say around 20 centimeter big defect, multiple repairs are done. Now this has so much of bulge in front of the abdomen, almost more than a pregnant lady. This patient would lean backwards to uh, take care of the spine, the gravity, and that will lead to a constant backache. Now this was a lady who actually came from a village and with this kind of an abdomen, she could not sit on the floor. So she will pass urine in the standing position, stools in the standing position. She cannot get on the bullock cart. She cannot go inside the ST bus and she was destined to die in a farm. So this is the kind of quality of life these people have. And therefore we have to, this ruptured cylinder needs to be closed. The one very, another important part of the abdominal wall reconstruction is that the linea alba is actually a tendon of the abdomen. So like you have all the tendons in the forearms, what happens when the tendon is cut, what the plastic surgeon would do, he would bring the muscle back, joint to the tendon and it will be kept under tension so that the uh, tendon can function. If it is kept loose, it will not function. So similarly, we need an abdominal wall which is disrupted to come together, sorry, you know what is known as a, under a physiological tension. So you have to close it under a physiological tension, which will have some tension but not a major tension on the abdominal wall. And therefore, to close such abdominal wall, you uh, the people came out with the concept of component separation. Now, what are the components of the abdomen? So basically, components of the abdomen are two recti on either side and the three obliques on either side. So these are all the muscles which are the different components. And these are the different component separation techniques which have been uh, designed by these various people in the history. So, so basically what they say is that these three muscles, one of these three muscles or one of these fascias, if you divide it and you slide the muscle one on the other, you can actually bring a midline closer. So this was the first concept which was first done by Ramirez. Actually, you don't know Ramirez, it was an Albanese. But like many of us, you know, he did not publish it or he was not very popular. So ultimately, when Ramirez came in 1990, it started doing the Ramirez procedure. And thereafter, uh, so this anterior component separation, and then Professor Yuri Novitsky came out with a posterior component separation. So these two became a famous. So let's see what is done in this. So basically, here the flaps are raised. Like how was the Dr. Siva Kumar told us to raise the flap, but he was doing it endoscopically. Here we do it in open surgery. So you raise the lipocrit in his flap and you reach beyond linear semilunaris and you divide the external oblique. Then you separate external oblique from internal oblique. Now this is a neuro, this is an absolutely avascular area. Now what will happen is this will slide this component medially. So the entire abdomen is divided into an external oblique and internal transverse rectus complex. And this complex moves medially, this moves laterally, and that's how you actually uh, do the medialization and eventually you can close the defects. Here you can see that the big defect was closed and these are the two cuts on the external oblique exposing the internal oblique. So this is in nutshell was the anterior component separation. Now this was done in 1990 and people have started doing all over the world. But then soon they realized the problem. The problem was that when you were dividing this perforators to the skin, the skin was getting necrosed and that was almost in 30 to 40 percent of cases. So almost one third of people who develop a skin necrosis and they he used to put an only mesh. So when the skin flap is necrosed and you divide it, 
you are bang on the mesh the mesh invariably gets infected and you will have to remove the mesh so the recurrence of this procedure was again in the range of around 40% to obviate this problem alexandria solis came out with another he said ki you preserve this periambulator perforator and you spare them so he called it as opops and in this procedure you have to make a sep different subcutaneous tunnels and you try and conserve all the perforators what dr siva was talking about that he split the mesh and puts around those perforators so he does something like that but eventually again when you do such a massive dissection at some point of time this will get evolves and many of them would to again get a skin necrosis so this is we did some of this perforator sparing component separation also now this was another concept which came of endoscopic component separation so what what this is that why you want to raise laparoscopic flap make a separate incision beyond linea semilunaris and you pass a balloon inside and insufflate between the external and internal oblique so now here on the roof you have an external oblique on the floor there is an internal oblique you take another port inside and you start dividing external oblique on the roof so you are doing same thing but you are not doing it from outside you are doing it from inside and that will actually separate the external oblique and you can then separate from internal oblique which is already with the pneumo it is separated and you can then go back and close the abdomen so this is something which was described carbonyl came with another idea what he said is that you do a reef stopper repair that means you do a retrorectus dissection but because you cannot put a big piece of mesh you cut the slings and go between the internal and transverse oblique so this man actually extended the mesh beyond this so he was putting a large pieces of mesh he was closing the midline because reef stopper repair itself would allow around 8 cm of release but what used to happen is that he actually did not realize that he is sacrificing the neurovascular bundles here and therefore this rectus muscle over a period of time would atrophy and therefore the entire abdominal wall reconstruction will become a abdominal wall destruction so this actually went to dogs now we i started doing component separation since 2010 and in 2015 actually we published in indian journal of surgery our first experience of all these various techniques so some of them are ramirez technique some of them were endoscopic component separation some of them were even carbonyl and some of them were uh, so with all that we realized that overall our 25 to 30% of patients had a skin necrosis so that was a challenging problem over there so these are the various options that we have so we have an anterior component separation but that is a skin flap necrosis this is a endoscopic component separation but that leads to a very limited release and where will you put a mesh you can't put a mesh because you have not dissected this space and therefore you will be putting a small retrorectus mesh the reef stopper repair which again gives you around 8 cm defect but then again there is a limited release and a small mesh and a carbonyl but that leads to a rectus muscle atrophy so all these four different procedures of component separation had their own fallacy till this man came out and this is a transverse abdominis release by professor yuri novitsky he came with a very novel concept and he said that you go into the retrorectus tunnel you go into the retrorectus space and you don't divide this sling which carbonyl used to divide instead you divide the transverse abdominis muscle and go between the transverse abdominis muscle and transalis fascia what he calls is pre transalis plane now this plane was never thought of by anybody but from the cadaveric dissection he realized that he can actually put bed an access to this medial to linea semilunaris and that will actually serve the purpose so let's see how how it is being done so if there are basically two component separation technique so suppose this is an hemi abdomen and this is a neurovascular bundle between internal and transverse abdominis muscle this is a huge defect now what you do in anterior component separation is that you enter the space between external and internal oblique either by open technique or by endoscopic technique and then you separate external from internal oblique this becomes anterior component separation there is another posterior component separation where they enter the retrorectus space and from there they divide the transverse abdominis and they go between transverse abdominis and the transalis fascia which is a posterior component separation but each one of them would release the midline and you will be able to medialize and close the defect so this is basically there are the two basic component separation but then acst had its own fallacy now how the transverse abdominis release is done this has been illustrated by uh, philip moisen from uh, belgium very very beautifully explained so if this is an hemi abdomen these are the two uh, the rectus muscle and these are three obliques and transverse abdomen is always goes little bit beyond on the linea seminaris so this is the one hemi abdomen what you do is that you divide the posterior rectus sheath near the linea alba you do a retrorectus dissection 
then you divide the posterior lamella of internal oblique, then you divide transverse abdominis, and you go into pretransalis pain. So this is how you get a release of midline. It, because you have divided these links, also there is a release of anterior fascia. So this is the concept of uh, transverse abdominis release. And then at the end, you put a giant prosthesis. So basically, you have you, in a full-blown tar, what you have done is you have dissected from diaphragm to diaphragm, and you have gone from psoas to psoas. So there is a huge place available, and where you can put one mesh, or you can even put a, diamond, a home plate format, or two meshes, or 50 by 50, one mesh, and basically shield the entire abdomen. So this is the uh, uh, this is how it is done. Now the same procedure can also be done by endoscopic group, what is known as ETEPTA. So it is an extended, totally extra peritoneal transverse abdominis release. So basically, there are two rectorectus spaces, which are actually not joined by each other, but there is a you know, falciform ligament, which is a pre-peritoneal layer. And there are umbilical ligaments, again, which is a pre-peritoneal layer. And you have a two bogros space on either side. Now, what you do is that you take a port somewhere in the epigastrium, you take another port so about five, five fingers away and a third port over here. And you do a crossover. So from one posterior rectus sheath, you go below the falciform ligament, but above the peritoneum, uh, below the lineal line, above, below the falciform ligament, uh, above the falciform ligament, and you go to the opposite posterior rectus sheath. So this is known as a crossover. So when you cross over, you have not gone into the abdomen, you are completely extra peritoneal. And now you dissect this, entire rectus uh, this CPA by another port and then you can actually put a big piece of mesh which is a small hernia. But in case you have to do a and that same thing you can do even from the lower side that is known as the lower crossover for the epigastric hernia. And then if you are falling short of uh, still more middleization you can divide the transverse abdominis like what you do in the open surgery and then you can actually go into the pre-transversalis pain into the bogoro space. And the same thing you can do on the opposite side by taking another port and then again, you can go to the opposite. So when, when you do all this, you have actually made this entire thing into a one space. And then you can put it a giant prosthetic reinforcement. These are all very, very revolutionary concepts. Technically, these are highly demanding. But yes, it, when it can be done, it's too good for the patient because there is hardly any incision. It's a minimal access surgery. And you are putting an uncoated mesh outside the peritoneal cavity. You are closing the peritoneum, you are closing the anterior rectus sheath, you are correcting the divarication, and you can actually do a proper abdominal wall reconstruction. So this is one of these ETEPs, that is, this is how it is being done. Uh, so you cut the posterior rectus sheath on either side. This is a transverse abdominis release, which is done through the ETEP. And then you can lay a big piece of mesh, uncoated mesh, into the retrorectus space. And then you can desufflate the abdomen. So transverse abdominis release increases the volume of abdominal cavity. So, you know, what happens is that the transverse, these are the transverse fibers. So when they contract, they actually grip the abdomen and they cause a, what is known as a hook tension. So when you divide this transverse abdominis muscle, it will increase the cavity. It is like how you do a sphincterotomy in fissure in anode and the spasm goes away and the anal diameter increases. Similarly, when you divide the transverse abdominis, the abdominal cavity will increase by almost 25 to 30 percent which is a bone in cases of loss of domain. A significant medial advancement of the posterior fascia. Therefore, you don't need a dual mesh. You will close the posterior fascia, which will act as a barrier. And on the top, you can put an uncoated mesh. There is a significant medial advancement of the anterior fascia. And that, so you, when you close the midline, there the functionality is restored. And we are making the cylinder intact. And therefore, all physiological activity can take place. There is a placement of a large mesh, giant prosthetic reinforcement visceral sac, and because of this, the recurrence rates are very low. So transverse abdomen is released in most of the large series. Is, the recurrence is, is less than 5% in the range of 2 to 3%, which was not in anterior component separation. So this gives an absolutely durable repair. And neurovascular bundle to the skin are not spared because you are not raising any flaps. And the muscle is also, uh, they are also spared because you are not dividing the neurovascular bundle. And therefore, there is a decreased surgical site occurrences. In short, the transverse abdominis release restores the anatomy, physiology, and native biomechanics, and that it is truly an abdominal wall reconstruction procedure. So a we have a sizable experience of this hernia. So this was a large primary ventral hernia, huge hernia of over 12 centimeter defect, and we could achieve through the transverse abdominis release a good scar and an abdominal wall reconstructed. Similarly, there was another patient which we saw first, a huge hernia of around 16 centimeter. 
this patient again had a midline closure with a proper abdominal wall reconstruction. These were the patients who had a multiple abdominal surgeries, multiple scars on the abdomen, huge hernia. Even C became a quite uh, well reconstructed. This is yet another subzified hernia. So this was this is a subcostal hernia. This is a subzified hernia, and this subzified hernia again we could close it with the transverse abdominal release. This was around eight centimeter subzified hernia, which is normally difficult to do, but this could be closed. Um, this will be difficult with the anterior component, but with the posterior component it could be closed. This is a large subcostal hernia following open cholecystectomy. And this patient again had a absolutely functional abdominal wall with muscle approximation. This was a very interesting case of iliac hernia. So now this patient had an iliac blade which was removed for chondrosarcoma. And through that, patient developed a hernia. Now, there are no borders here. Where are you going to put a mesh? So ultimately, we did a transverse abdominal release. And we actually fixed the mesh to these bones by a bone anchor. And with a very wide overlap, almost crossing the midline from behind and midline from the front. And this patient is doing very well after surgery. So this was one patient who had a very ugly scar, multiple surgical failure, and a large hernia. And same patient at the end of one year with a very cosmetically appealing scar. The this, this same patient, when you know, functionally you can see that you know, all the abdominal functions were, uh, uh, when this patient you see here, the abdomen is absolutely not bulging. And same patient CT scan. So a lot of people say that when you are dividing muscle, you are compromising muscle. But here you see, this patient preoperatively had a very, very small uh, obliques and absolutely rolled up recti. And the same patients in the same sequence of CT, one year postoperatively, you can see that the recti, these obliques have become thicker and the recti have also become thicker. So basically the muscle doesn't atrophy. It is in a true sense will cause a abdominal wall reconstruction. And we have a publication of this star cases of 100, which occurred last year in a hernia. And um, so in conclusion, in a treatment of large mental hernia, you must close the midline. That is the first thing that one we want us to understand. It is to be under a physiological tension. Then only way to do it is a component separation. You have to have a wide processes because you want to have a durable repair, a low wound morbidity, and tar remains a promising solution. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ramesh. That's an excellent lecture. I think uh, the concept, the overview, everything so nicely described with the app pictures. I think the first the slide itself is, I think, is one of the best I can see, saying that linea alba is the uh, skeleton of the anterior abdominal wall. From there on, I think it went on slide by slide and uh, making everybody, even the beginner, to understand the concept of the component separation. The discussion is open, starting with our president, followed by our. We have two more minutes. Wonderful lecture, Ramesh, as always, and uh, really like the concept of uh, ETAP TAR and TAR and uh, PCST. And uh, you have become a master teacher for component separation all across the country and abroad. And uh, we are so happy to have you in IAGES and uh, also, congratulations for being AWR president. I think Ishwar uh, will go ahead with yeah. the panel yeah. discussion. Let's... We uh, we have uh, more than 700 uh, viewers with us tonight, and uh, my congratulations to all of you. And uh, over to you, Ishwar. Thank you. Thank you. We invite Dr. Ramesh Agarwala, an enterprising personality and engaging speaker. We are keeping the always the best as the last one, a surgeon for excellence, personally from Fortis, uh, Kolkata. I think he is one of the pillar of IAGS, be it a past president, chairman of the Fellowship of Advanced Laparoscopy, and also research council chairman, and also going to be upcoming organizing secretary for the World Congress of Endoscopy Surgery year 2024. He is going to engage all of you and uh, keep this uh, day. We are going to sign up high with uh, Dr. Ramesh Agarwala firing all the interesting case captions. Over to you, Ramesh. You can thank start you, Thank you very much, Ishwin. Thank you very much. I think everybody is going to sleep. It's possible. No, no, no. We are all awake. <laughs> we are awake. And so anyway, we'll get, get ahead with everything instead of you know, uh, wasting time. So. 
Ramesh, maximum crowd for panel discussion. We have just kept it on and they've all gone to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so welcome to this panel discussion. <laughs> so we are going to talk about the complications of hernia. We have, I have no disclosures. Some of the videos have been contributed by my colleagues and I'm very grateful to them for their contribution. So we have a very, very erudite panel. Dr. Sunil Pokut, our president. Dr. Ajay Kriplani needs no introduction. Dr. Rajesh Kullar also, he needs no introduction. Dr. Ramesh Kunyani and Dr. Shiva Kumar. So <clears throat> we will uh, divide this uh, panel discussion into ventral hernia and groin hernias. So whenever we talk about complications, we say it's intraoperative or postoperative complications. But if we see all the complications occur in the intraoperative intra or perioperative period, and some of them manifest in the postoperative period. So I, I personally believe postoperative complication is a misnomer. It's all intraoperative complications. So when you look at the intraoperative complications for a ventral hernia, it could be during access, edisulysis, and application of the tackers. So these are the broad three headings which we are going to talk about. So we, we are going to just talk about simple scenarios and otherwise. So when we look at the complications, it is 13.2%, seroma is 2.6%, recurrence is 4.7%, there is mesh infection, pain is 3%, prolonged alias 3%, urinary retention. So these are the broad com com complications we look at in case of ventral hernias. And cellulitis, atrocarcitis, 2%. So if we look at these intraoperative complications, so 50% of the complications of laparoscopic surgery happen at the time of access. So access is very, very important. And especially in ventral hernias or incisional hernias, where already the abdomen has been opened once or twice, it assumes a very significant role. So uh, uh, I start with you, Sunil, May okay. 34 years. Umbilical hernia, three into four centimeter defect. Surgery planned is IPOM plus. Palmer point access, we do. So I just want to know what are the precautions would you advise, Sunil, when you yeah. take a Palmer point access? Yeah, so wonderful uh, question. Very practical. First and foremost is I uh, would advise the anesthetist to put in a Riles tube and aspirate and completely suck out the contents from the stomach so that uh, stomach doesn't come in the way of putting in the first row car second thing uh, we during the pre-operative examination we make a note whether spleen is enlarged or not also during seno sonography also it is uh, uh, taken that whether spleen is enlarged or not and uh, for operatively before putting in the car or very needle in palmer's point uh, we percuss and make sure that uh, there is a no distended stomach, no palpable spleen. So I think uh, one has to take care of prevention of injury to stomach and spleen in most of the cases. And then, yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so these are the very important points. So, you know, most of these ventral hernias or incisional hernias, you have to go through the palmer's point. So this cannot be, uh, you know, forgotten, which is very important. So there are different methods of access. It's your closed, varies needle, open port, Octiview. But we should practice the uh, method of access one, with one which is familiar and keep on repeating it. All are safe, all have complications. So this is what I am showing. This video shows that we are in the stomach. And this has happened because this Palmer point access, which uh, Dr. Sunil has said the anesthetist had not put in the Riles tube. And because the Riles tube was not put in, it is a thin subject. So the uh, varies went into the stomach and the pressure didn't seem very high and the troker again went into the stomach. So it is so important to have the Riles tube in place and to see that the stomach is deflated, which is very important. And this is Optiview. So uh, people who use Optiview feel that Optiview is the uh, uh, more safer than other points of access. This is a video shared by a senior surgeon of IAGS. And here you see he's in the bowel. 
so anything can happen so access if you lose if 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 you get into trouble during access you are bowled out on the first this so uh, dr ajay 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 this is for you you can see this picture there are bowel additions you made a entry into it you put your telescope and you see this is the bowel so you need certain particular types of instruments if you are going to do excisolysis in this case so what what would you advise uh, that what type of instrument should you use to use handle this bowel ramesh these seem to be one of the toughest additions because the serosa of the small intestine is virtually mingling with the parietal peritoneum there's hardly any plane between the serosa and the parietal peritoneum and there may be a previous mesh to which the bowel may be aderent and you have to be extremely careful and in all patients of incisional hernia it is a good idea particularly if they have been operated multiple time to keep these patients on clear liquid diet for at least 48 hours before so that the intestine is empty at the time and maybe you can prepare the bowel give them intestinal antiseptic particularly the fagot or nostrox just in case to the bowel gets opened up and also discuss with the patient counsel them pre operatively that we are anticipating additions in the abdomen and we may change our plan so this pre operative counseling is extremely important in all patients who are undergoing you know multiple surgeries who mul after multiple failures of ventral hernia repair the instruments as you said are has to be very delicate lightweight fenestrated instruments you can't use a merlin to hold this intestine you have to have a fenestrated lightweight uh, instrument so that when you handle the bowel you handle it very very gently don't give excessive traction and we have a policy of adhesiolysis you know to make adhesiolysis more successful never first go in the center of the adhesion always start with the periphery the best dissecting instrument is a cold scissors a monopolar cautery in such kind of adhesion is should you know we we should get, get disconnected and even use of a, a, a higher energy sources like harmonic should not be done in such difficult adhesions start from periphery go where the adhesions are least go where the adhesions are first on the uh, on the omentum side first release the omentum and then gradually come centrally from one side to the center from the caudal side to the center from the cranial side to the center from your side to the center because you cannot go posteriorly you have only in laparoscopic unfortunately the posterior side is not exposed to you so come from periphery to the center and you must at one point decide if the going is tougher if you think that there is a very high possibility of enterotomy in that particular stroke and the strokes of the scissors should be very small if you cut small you are going to cause a small enterotomy if you are going to cut large you are going to cut a large enterotomy and when you are dissecting these dissections go beyond the peritoneum go beyond the peritoneum if maybe you can take you know it's always said that a piece of peritoneum on the intestine is always better than a piece of intestine on the peritoneum so go beyond the peritoneum to do the adhesiolysis if the peritoneum is completely destroyed maybe you can go beyond the posterior rectus field because ultimately you are going to put a mesh so all attention should be to prevent an enterotomy prepare the patient properly do a thorough dissection and if you find that it is impossible you know you cannot find any plane that in the best interest of the patient do a small uh, anterior incision do an enterotomy Uh, do a open uh, uh, dissection do a hybrid procedure uh, so that you can subsequently also close the defect from the anterior side and then put a mesh from the posterior side so lightweight fenestrated instrument cold scissors going beyond the peritoneum to do the adhesiolysis preventing enterotomy at all cost choosing a hybrid procedure if it is required so you can see uh, ajay you uh, really said it well so you can see in the video we are going in a plane above so you don't choose the plane between the bowel and the peritoneum you can go a plane above so you take a bit bit of peritoneum which we've done in this so the plane of dissection is very important you use scissors that scar sharp cold sharp adhesiolysis should be done the instrument should be light and they should not have a catch so if they have a catch then you tend to uh, you know crumple the bowel and can cause uh, iatrogenic injury so which is very very important so 
So uh, now this is Ramesh for you, 52 year old female, planned laparoscopic uh, ventral hernia repair for incisional hernia. And then you see, this is, so what we can see the plane of dissection, which we are talking is not being adhered to. And uh, definitely this is a recipe for disaster. And that's what we were talking about. So there is no traction also. So right. what would you do to the entrotomy? Ramesh, specific question, what if there's an entrotomy, this is a small bowel, what would you do? So if you realize you've done an entrotomy now, this is the, this is the time to intervene. So if you, if person is confident enough, while the bowel is hanging, he can actually take the sutures because once the bowel falls down in a freely moving bowel, it is very difficult to close the intestine. That is number one. Number two, you may even lose a sight and then you may start struggling to search for it and that will lead to a lot of spillage. So as you do a little uh, entrotomy, you try and suture that after a little bit more this thing. But most important is that entire edisualysis will be done and whenever there is a uh, suspicion of entrotomy, it is better to take few stitches, zero muscular, and close that off. So, in this particular case, what would you do to the? You tackle the entrotomy. You've done it laparoscopically. In cases people who cannot do it, they can do a minor laparotomy and do it. The most important point you said you should do it while it's hanging. So it is very important. You should not complete the visualizes. So other either you would lose. But in this particular case, small bowel, not much of a spillage. What would you do to the hernia? Now, this is a very gray area and I think it's going to actually stir the pot. But I would probably not do it. You see, these patients, you have done, you have gone for one surgery and now you have created a complication, which can definitely cause, uh, already the patient has got a complication. And Dr. Udwade used to tell us, you know, that complication is allowed, but complication of a complication is not allowed. So you have complicated the matter by doing entrotomy and now you will further complicate if you put a mesh and then you have to explant it. So probably I would just do a thorough edisolysis and leave it at that stage, leave a drain inside. And after about say a week or 10 days or when I know that the thing has healed, uh, maybe I'll just repeat one more scan and then go ahead and do a repair. So this video is showing, you know, the entrotomy is being closed while the bowel is hanging. This is a very important point which we noted. And well said, Rabesh. Uh, so any of the panelists have any other view about the uh, hernia, what would you do for the hernia? Well, Ramesh, uh, it is really, as uh, Ramesh said, it is a very complicated situation. And I think every surgeon, every hospital, every team will have their own algorithm of handling this situation because there are no standard clear cut guidelines. Experience in such situations is very low, and there's no large series to make a recommendation based on sound information. I think the management of such entrotomies will depend on a lot of factors. Uh, I wish it was so simple that always you close the entrotomy and uh, uh, go in back again, because remember that when you go in the second time, again, it is going to be a difficult proposition, not a simple proposition, because that it is reform, and you have to choose the optimal time when to go in so that there's no bowel edema, which has subsided after the previous surgery, and also there are no adhesions, because as the edema starts subsiding, the adhesions start forming. I will categorize it into what is the size of the defect in the patient that I'm operating? What is the age of the patient? What are the, uh, the you know, attitude of the patient? The patient wants one-time surgery or the patient will be okay. You have discussed the patient, the possibility beforehand, what has been the willingness of the patient in such situation and what mandate the patient has given to the surgeons. The op options are that if the hernia defect is not very large, if I think that uh, uh, I can use, uh, the defect is not very large, and then we'll, I'll complete the adhesolysis and even do a primary tissue repair if the edges of the defect can be approximated soundly without any tension. Say the defect is four centimeters or five centimeters big, and I'm sure that I can approximate them without tension because remember that before laparoscopic hernia repair, before mesh, we have been using open repair and the recurrent set of open repair is only 4 to 5% if it is done properly in a small defect and the defect is closed properly. So I think many surgeons, many patients, if you discuss them preoperatively, this option, they will take that chance and avoid a resurgery in 95% of patients with the recurrence only of 5% because they will be still cured in 95% of patients. Uh, open surgery. The other option is that 
you uh, do complete the entrotomy and do an anterior kind of a repair. Either you can put an onlay mesh. Don't forget these onlay meshes forever. Don't abandon them. They have cured lots of patients over the centuries, and they have proven that they are, may not be as effective as the posterior mesh, but they still work in a good majority of patients. So if the defect is a little larger, then you can do a uh, you, you can do a, a anterior uh, you know only mesh repair, or if you have discussed with the patient and you find that you completely lies the addition, the patient has been extremely keen that no he wants only a laparoscopic repair and not an open repair. Then in two certain situations we have gone back, closed the entrotomy, gone back and redone a laparoscopy on seventh or eighth day and did an IPOM repair. And if that defect is very large, then we can even do a posterior component separation technique by after doing and closing an entrotomy, closing the peritoneum and putting a mesh into the anterior compartment. So these are all options available to surgeons, which will depend on what the mandate the patient has given to the surgeon, what options have been discussed before that. And you should try to do a procedure which may avoid a second surgery in a great majority of patients with a small chances of it. So basically what we are looking at is that if there is an entrotomy, then would you put uh, intraperitoneal mesh? No, no. So, so that, that was the, yeah, so Ramesh, coming back to you, so your management remains the same. If you have a small entrotomy with gross pillage, you deal with the hernia in a similar way. And if you have a large bowel injury, how do you deal with the hernia? Even that also, I mean, I so in all so. cases of entrotomy, whether it's a small bowel or large bowel, you are not going to use an intraperitoneal mesh. Okay. Depending on the situation, as Dr. Kriptani Ajay said, that you might do a suture closure or you might do only repair, depending on the circumstances. But this is a no-no. Intraperitoneal is no-no. But uh, uh, is there any role of biological mesh? Ramesh? So the biological meshes are known to fight infection, but you know they also have a very high recurrence. The third thing is that they are extremely expensive. Fourth is that they are not available in all sizes. So with all those things, I think probably it's better to just call it a day that day. And, as, uh, and more of us, you know, it's not in the inventory of all the hospitals because right. it's not a, a frequently used. So at the time when you want that biological mesh, you don't uh, get it. So this is we we have said. So this is what the recommendations are that you have to repair the entrotomy, and if they say the recommendation is minimal spillage, but they have never quantified what minimal spillage means. Or you can do after three to seven days, as Jay said, and you can do a primary open repair. So these are the recommendations: open prosthetic repair. So this is there. So Shiva, this is for you. IPOM plus for paraumbilical hernia, post first, post operative day. There is when you go on your rounds, you see there is tachycardia, tachypnea, abdomen is distended, tender bowel sounds sluggish. You do a CT scan, which is suggestive of bowel perforation, and the options we have is either go for a laparoscopy or laparotomy. All right. So you being a very experienced surgeon, you go for a laparoscopy, and you see this is the condition. You see, there's all fecal contamination and the mesh is there. So, what do you do with the mesh now, Shiva? Uh, I have to remove the mesh. Like, uh, I think so because the contamination, which is like going to be there as a fecal matter, my, in my course, say, like, what I say is like, remove the mesh also when, I, when you are going for the. So, you have to remove the mesh. So this is so in the first scenario we are thinking about whether to put in the mesh or not, and in the second scenario we have to do. And what do you do about the hernia? Hernia, just like uh, we are not going to close. Like that's why I'm like uh, let we are going to take the mesh out. If if the like uh, already Dr. Gurbani uh, told like uh, what we can do is like the small like uh, hernia we can do with the polling repair like anatomical repair. Otherwise, like you come out because you are going to do again, like uh, you have to go for the, with the complication of like so much of fecal contamination, you are going to keep a train and other things like, uh, I think so like better come out of the complication. So perfect. So this is, these are again, the recommendations which are coming. 
makes its explantation, primary repair of the hernia if feasible. Uh, this is what the recommendations are. So is Rajesh around? No, he's gone. Yeah, no, I'm still here. Oh, he's, 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 he's. You see, the most important thing, the most important thing in this situation is you remove the mesh and you must find out the cause of perforation. You must identify from where the bowel has leaked. You must repair that. Yes, that, that be, yes that is the big That is the most important yes. thing. So uh, no, that can not... be done if you are able to do it laparoscopically, do it laparoscopically. If you are not able to do laparoscopically, please do a laparotomy, walk the bowel, find the site of injury in the bowel, repair it. If it's a large bowel, do an ileostomy, terminal ileostomy. That will only save the patient. Otherwise, you will lose the patient. <clears throat> well, uh, Rajesh, so what we took it for granted was that you are going to look at the perforation, give a lavage, do all that. So what we are looking at is the debate is whether to put, remove the mesh, not to remove the mesh, how to deal with the hernia. That's the reason I just pointed out these points. So this scenario is for you, Rajesh, 55-year-old female, obstructed, query strangulated hernia clinically. Now, what would you do? You put in a laparoscope, would you continue laparoscopy or would you do a hybrid or open repair? You see, in such cases, if clinically you think it's strangulated, you have gone in. The important thing is in these cases, if there is combination of bowel and omentum, then always reduce the omentum first. Bowel is usually spared, but if it is only bowel, then you must cut the ring first, the uh, you know, constricting ring should be uh, divided and then reduce the bowel and then look at the <coughs> vascularity of the bowel. Uh, you can wait for 10 minutes, you can put some warm saline, you can put some warm gauze piece and wait, give 100% oxygen and then decide about vascularity of the bowel. So and in this particular case, Rajesh, you can see the bowel is here. So you yeah. are putting your, you know, uh, saline filled warm gauze and seeing the vascularity is perfectly all right. But what do you do, do in the hernia in this case? You see, in these cases, uh, because of uh, pre-gangrenous uh, state of the bowel, there is always transmigration of bacteria into the fluid which is there in the sac. So putting in the mesh is out of question. Uh, you cannot leave this hernia, hernial opening uh, like this because uh, another bowel loop will go inside. So you suture close this hernial defect. And uh, many of these uh, hernias, even with suture closure only, may not have a recurrence. But if it has a recurrence, you then take it as a second goal. But, but you, uh, must close the, you must close the hernial defect. Yes, I agree suture with close. you. But uh, Rajesh, if everybody no, is not as experienced as you are laparoscopically. So would you say that if they are unable to continue laparoscopically, they can open up, hybrid. open and suture close the defect. Uh, hybrid no, or open, open repair. Yeah. No hybrid, so, Ramesh, overly and open repair in a midline defect, just by laparoscopic suture, you cannot approximate and do a sound repair as you can in an open lipid line. So in a small defect like this, which is a midline, I'll open up, do a good closer, because that will again give a good chance of, you know, not having a hernia. Laparoscopic suture repair will not be as effective as open repair in this patient. Yeah, basically you have to close the defect. Yes. That is the okay. So just watch this video. This is what the ego of a surgeon does. So, you know, see, he's enlarged the opening, but there's so much of pulling and tugging uh, is there. So if you see what is happening is, there is an iatrogenic entrotomy. So the whole idea of my showing this video is, please, when you enter the OR, keep your ego at home and then enter the ER. And in case of irre irreducible hernia or obstructed hernias, which are not strangulated, and if you cannot you know, do the adicinalysis, as in this case, which you can see, as uh, we are doing adicinalysis, we are trying to get the omentum first, which Ajay said that you should try to get the momentum. 
So even after getting the momentum, if you find, so in this case, you see, we are trying to get the momentum out, uh, quite resistant. And once you take the momentum out, then you should go for the bowel. So in cases where you see, we, we could see they were bowel posteriorly, the ant or this was anteriorly, it was taking quite a bit of time. So this is an option. So this is what is called the hybrid repair, where you can make an incision and then dissect the sac. Do the edicylysis, open edicylysis. You can suture close the defect. And then do I form. So this is just an option for irreducible or obstructed hernia, which I said. So uh, Sunil, this is for you, bleeding at Tucker's side. So how do you prevent this? Yeah. <clears throat> so this seems to be uh, bleeding from the inferior epigastric vessels while doing a IPOM or IPOM plus with the fixation or with a Tucker. The prevention is basically to see the vessels beforehand when we are before we apply the mesh inside, we, we see the inferior epigastric vessels. In last five, six years, uh, we have started marking the inferior epigastric vessels on the skin. So that helps uh, even the junior colleague or uh, even the OT assistant to know that where is the inferior epigastric vessel. So basically this happens because sometimes we are using a thick composite mesh uh, and uh, uh, if the taker inadvertently gone into the vessel then it will bleed like this the best way to control is the immediately we apply some pressure but this looked like an arterial bleeding and this would require a u stitch uh, to control the bleeding yes and, uh, so the minor point, uh, venous bleeding uh, with a yes sorry? so the point point is well taken sunil yeah. so only thing which i want to emphasize here <clears throat> is either pressure or a suture, but no use of energy sources because the mesh is there. So if the mesh is already tacked, then you cannot use the energy sources or destroy. And as you said aptly, this, you know, you can mark, you can be aware of the abdominal. So you can dim the lights and you can mark the vessels, trans translate and see. So, uh, So you can mark these vessels perioperatively to avoid this. So when we look at the post-operative complications, uh, Ajay, for you, so what are the post postoperative pain is one of the complications. So what could be the cause in uh, a ventral hernia, IPOM plus, when we are doing, what could be the cause of the pain? I think that's a very important question. I think we here to understand that unlike lab quality, we are the laparoscopic approach is very pain-free as compared to the open approach. In laparoscopic ventral hernia, it is not such a pain-free situation as compared to the open surgery because you are using a large foreign body. You are fixing this large foreign body to the muscles by multiple tacks, which often go into number of 20 to 30, depending on the size of the mesh and the defect of the mesh. On the top of it, you are putting sutures through the mesh. These transfacial sutures which cause necrosis and edema of the muscles. So post-operative pain is a very, very important consideration of the laparoscopic ventral hernia repair. For the last five years, we are giving uh, T, uh, the TAP, the TAP block to all these patients in which we use the uh, local anesthetic agent and inject it into the plane between the transversus muscle and the internal oblique muscle intraoperatively guided by the laparoscopic field. And we give a two quadrant uh, a tab block on the right side and on the left side in the subcostal area to block the intercostal nerves which are supplying. And through the laparoscopy, you can have an excellent view whether you are injecting these anesthetic uh, 
agents in the post-operative period and uh, keep the patient pain-free. The, the anesthetist is requested subsequently for uh, use of uh, intravenous analgesics on the first day and if required supplementation and the patient should be ambulated as early as possible. So early okay. you ambulate the patient, the faster the pain goes away. Yes. This so, is a yes. So the, so yes, sorry, sorry. post-operative analgesia and early ambulation will take care of it. So how, how do you prevent, can you do anything to prevent this pain? So transfixation sutures and tackers are the main thing. Transfixation sutures, we have long back abundant these transfacial sutures, uh, Ramesh. Mostly because of the pain and necrosis, and there have been patients in which we have seen that the patient is coming with four hernias after that eye palm repair at all the four sites of the transfacial sutures. So for last more than a decade, we have been using intracorporeal fixation of the mesh, which takes only the posterior rectus sheath, takes a very wide bite, and it is just 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 tight. You know, it is neither too tight nor it is too loose. So that decreases the post-operative pain, but you cannot eliminate pain in the post-operative period. The only thing we can say when you're using transfixation sutures, that when you knot those sutures, they should be A knots. It should not be very tight, so it might reduce. As you said about the treatment, uh, you've already covered analgesics, nerve block, tap block, which most of the units across the country use to prevent post-operative pain. So post-operative seromas, it's not a complication, it's an expected outcome, and they reach peak on seventh post-operative day, and by 90 days, almost, all the seromas are resolved. Symptomatic, up to 30%. So we should always counsel the patient, so they expect it's, it's not unexpected, they don't think that it's a complication of the surgery. So uh, Ramesh, uh, this is for you, prevention of seroma. So when you, you've you got the hernial sac, so what do you do something special in the hernial sac? Well, you can do something special to the hernial sac to reduce the post operative seroma. So whenever I do an IPOM plus, I usually remove the sac. Many of many of the other panelists may not agree, but I pull out as much sac as possible, only one which is closely uh, adherent to the skin, I leave it. And then I give them a compression bandage on the top of it and that works most of the time. Take it. So another thing which is there, so when, when we have this momentum, sometimes we are unable to take out the momentum. So what happens, we leave a bit of momentum inside. So we should try to keep the sack as completely empty as possible. There have been, uh, uh, you know, uh, this the attempt at cauterization of the sack or injection of the fibrin glue to prevent seroma. So these, these have happened. Closure of defect also, we feel that it reduces seroma. And as you said, abdominal binder or pressure dressing helps. So for how long do you use abdominal binder for a pressure dressing? Maybe not abdominal binder. We, I uh, give a big piece of gauze pieces, about 10, 12 of them, and then apply yeah. dinoplast and keep them for about seven days. Seven days, okay. So it's okay. So this is also, we also follow the same thing. So that is okay. So the treatment of seroma is reassurance, nasal inactivity, and if there is persistent, you have to aspirate with full aseptic and antiseptic precautions. And surgical drainage excision of seroma lining, if possible, is done in recurrent symptomatic seromas after aspiration. So these are the recurrent. So Rajesh, for you, this will be there. So recurrence is a bane of any hernia surgery. And the most important benchmark for the assessment of efficacy of hernia repair. So whenever the patient comes, the first question they ask whether the hernia is going to come back or uh, no. So uh, we know that closure of defect reduces recurrence and a hernia is larger than two centimeters, you should use a prosthesis. This is the evidence. But we know we one of the important causes of recurrence is not an adequate size mesh, a small mesh. So Rajesh, what is your viewpoint? What should be the size of the mesh? What should be the overlap in IPOM? Yeah, you see in IPOM, uh, the standard teaching in the past has been that you should have overlap of four to five centimeter uh, than the size of the defect on all sides. But uh, now the latest thing we have is the area of the defect uh, as compared to the mesh. And it should be in the ratio of 
36 is to 1, as uh, explained uh, by Dr. Kaplani in his presentation also. So uh, you see, it is very important that a larger uh, the mesh uh, used, it reduces the incidence of uh, hernia. Closure of defect uh, does not reduce the size of the mesh. Even if you close, if you do IPOM plus, but the original size of the defect should be taken as it is. Uh, so yes, these sir. are the important things. So, so and proper fixation of the mesh. Yes, so this is the most important point when you are saying, so closing the defect does not reduce the size of the mesh. So you have to make the mesh size as if you're not closed. And this mesh defect ratio is the most uh, important thing now. And the hernia with the entire incision line, in case of incisional hernia, should be also closed. Absolutely. So when you see this mesh, me, mesh defect ratio, so this is what, if it is greater than 16, you see the recurrence rate is supposed to be zero. If it's th 13 to 16, it is 9%. It is 8 to 13, 35%, less than 8 is 70%. So this is the importance of this mesh defect ratio. So uh, Rajesh, uh, again, coming to you, another important thing which you said is the proper- Can I make a small yes. point on this? Yes, one? yes. This is such an important topic yet you have brought up such an important point that earlier we always used to feel that a five centimeter overlap is enough but that is a thing of the past so for a five centimeter defect if you are using a 15 into 15 centimeter mesh it is inadequate despite closer because the mesh defect ratio is not 16. the ideal overlap for a five centimeter defect should be seven centimeters so you have to ideally use a 20 into 20 centimeter mesh. So this five centimeter overlap now no more is accepted, which Rajesh has so correctly said. So you have to use larger meshes and particularly so in patients who are obese, you have to still use still larger meshes because in obese patients, the chances of recurrence is high. So perhaps except for very small defects, five centimeter overlap is now totally gone and you have to use mesh defect ratio which is the most important thing as you rightly highlighted so uh, so rajesh uh, another this as you said proper mesh fixation so what do you exactly mean by proper mesh fixation see proper mesh, mesh fixation means that <clears throat> you should have uh, the mesh should be fixed in the posterior abdominal wall now uh, the different fixation devices which are available have different length of penetration in the posterior abdominal wall. An obese patient may have a lot of preperitoneal fat and the, only the uh, fixation device or tax may not be enough to fix the mesh properly. So transfacial fixation is equally important or more important uh, in these cases to fix the mesh properly. So uh, that is very, very important. So you have to prepare the, the place where the mesh is placed. Mixture of tax and transfacial suture is so and the double crowning. Yeah. So, so, so it's perfect. So it is very important, as Rajesh said, there's a lot of fat often in the peritoneum. And if you don't defatten the peritoneum, you will never, the, these uh, fixation devices will never hold it. So Shiva, uh, uh, only, only cla one clarification. No, no, nothing else. Like uh, what the commercially available meshes, like 15 to 15 centimeter, 20 into 25 centimeter, or 20 into 30, 20 into 30, 30 centimeter. Are we getting like five for five centimeter defect? We are going to we can use the 20 into 20 meshes. Like it's not available. Are we recommending the company people to produce a mesh like in a such a way? I think so. We we should. Because see, if you are using 20 by 15, you are giving a proper overlap on one side, but you're not giving a proper overlap on the other side. Exactly. Yeah. So if it's a roundish or oval defect, then it, it has to be that. So we should have square meshes instead of, you know, rectangle, I mean, it's obla oblong meshes. Thank so you. Most, you, of the, most uh, of the people have 20 by 20, like, um, I know of at least the company which I use it, they have a 20 by 20. Which company, sir? Uh, so the BART, the Vendor X uh, uh, ST. BART company. They have a 20 by 20 patch. 
Okay. So Shiva, this is to you. Recurrence after laparoscopic surgery. What would you recommend? Open or laparoscopic? And why? Recurrent after laparoscopic surgery. Oh. <laughs> but uh, like uh, I, I can say this depend on the like uh, how the experienced surgeons like how it depend on the surgeon. Yeah. Like uh, depend on the surgery, like how the cases, recurrent cases is coming to you. You did the first surgery, you know the defect, like how it was, you know the addition, how it was, like then you can go for a like a diagnostic laparoscopy, then proceed. Or like frankly, like if the if some other surgeon did a surgery first, like laparoscopically, like you don't know the anatomy of the internal, like uh, in DDS structure. You can go for a diagnostic lab or you can go for the open surgery directly. That's my point. So, yeah, both options are there. If you're very experienced, confident, you can try laparoscopy or you can do open because open will give you a virgin plane to go about. And if there is a recurrence after open surgery, definitely the choice would be laparoscopic surgery. So this, this would be the recommendation. So, uh, Shiva, you can see this, this patient recurrent inframbilical hernia, six centimeter defect. This is, there was a IPOM for post appendicectomy incisional hernia nine years ago. Yeah. So, what I want to ask you, if you go for laparoscopic surgery, if you can see in this case, uh, the laparoscopic surgery is being attempted, what are the challenges of laparoscopic surgery? I think so. It's a uh, right side, like it's a. Uh, yeah, I think so. Rightly, of course, uh, hernia, right? Yeah. Right. Then, like first thing is the hydrosolysis. Then, so like the yes. Uh, first thing is hydrosolysis is going to complicate your thing. One first. Second thing is the vascular injury. How we are going to handle that? Because it's like nearby the doom of like a uh, triangle of doom as well as the. Uh, inferior inferior epigastric vessels which we are not going to visualize because so much of fibrosis like you, you cannot see the inferior mesenteric vessels so there is a chances of like a vascular injury as well as the in adesolysis you should be careful on this case yes so the main challenges are of the adesolysis which are huge so now sunil this for you male okay. 21 years old obstructed Query strangulated supraumbilical hernia. So, I pump plus for epigastric hernia one year, nine months ago. So, this is recurrence. So, we go in and this is what we see. So, you can see the border of the mesh. It is yeah. small, small defect. The momentum is gone in. So, what do you think is the cause of this hernia? I think uh, this transpatial suture. Yes, this you is know, the transpatial suture. Trans suture must have been taken with a wide gap in between. Yes. If so, you take a transpatial suture, take it with a very small gap, one to two mm in between, because it, otherwise it will necross the in between tissue yes. and lead to this uh, transpatial suture hernia. So I agree with you. So we this case was done by us only. So we visited the video, uh, we have all the recording. So this was the only suture we had made the mistake and uh, that's the price we paid for it. And here we are just suture closing because there was strangulation of the omentum and there was toxic fluid. So we didn't want to put in the mesh. So the patient is doing well, three years down the line. So this is uh, this. So mesh infection is a bane of hernia surgery complete disaster for the surgeon and the patient and prevention. So uh, Ajay, for you, what precautions do you take to prevent mesh infection? As you rightly said, Ramit, that, you know, mesh infection is a very disastrous complication for the patient. And uh, once a mesh infection occurs, you know, the patient's health is compromised for next year, year and a half from recovering the mesh infection because if the infection is not treated quickly and adequately, then the patient will continue to have sepsis in the anti-abdominal wall, even after removal of the mesh. So it is very important to prevent infection of the mesh. First and the foremost thing is that for laparoscopic hernia repair, you should always use autoclaved instruments. You should not use Cydex or formaldehyde chamber instruments whenever you are doing the laparoscopic surgery for the hernia. 
second entire team should give utmost care to aseptic techniques and there should be no breach in the aseptic technique during any of the procedure using the instruments transferring the instrument frequent changing of gloves the no unnecessary person should be allowed to enter inside the operation theater who has no direct function for this laparoscopic hernia repair and the entry should be kept to the minimum one should completely finish the dissection a, a pre operative a peri operative antibiotic should be given in a hernia patient uh, timely so that you know there is a high level of antibiotic uh, at the time of mesh implantation then once the dissection is and once the dissection is complete the surgeon must change the gloves the uh, the assisting nurse should also change the gloves and very carefully take the mesh out of the wrap and then this mesh should not be kept in the in the sheet you know which was being uh, uh, used since the beginning of the surgery a separate fresh new sheet should be taken and the mesh should be kept on that and carefully uh, the mesh should be you know uh, prepared by using rolling it and single stitch and then it should be very carefully inserted never directly through the wound but always through the port so that when you are inserting it it uh, should not come in contact with the skin and this should be the first surgery of the day uh, so that you know uh, the ot area is clean so use what to clave the instrument first on the list change gloves prevent mesh to come, come in contact with the skin and intravenous uh, this so these are also the recommendation okay so ramesh this is for you now 50 48 year old female i form 18 months back presents with abdominal sinus for 2 months ct shows collection around the mesh right so is there my question is is there any scope of salvage of this mesh so this is a after 18 months uh, this has come so this will be an atypical mycobacteria which is a mott or they call it mycobacterium mother than tuberculosis and uh, this the mesh will have to come out if it is no normal laparoscopic or otherwise open yes so and dissect the sinus take out every uh, this thing infected so in this case we have to remove the mesh you can do it laparoscopically open if we can do it laparoscopically it's better because if there is a recurrence so you have a virgin plane to go about again and you have to take out the sinus so this would be the thing in this case so you can see the pus is coming out and you can see the infected mesh is there and usually there is lot of fibrosis is there so when you are trying to remove this mesh you should also see that you removed all the tackers take it in the gloves and take it out So Rajesh, fifty-six year old female, I form for primary umbilical hernia, recurrence on the fourth postoperative day, and this is the video. So what went wrong? You see, the fixation has failed. The mesh has fallen down, and uh, the bowel has gone between the mesh and the abdominal wall, and that led to obstruction. So it's so important. The fixation is so important. So you will never have such a early recurrence if it is uh, not there. And I think this mesh is also absolutely now. Mesh is another way. This is a yes. large core mesh, and uh, yeah, the dual mesh is on other way. Yeah. So, uh, Ramesh, this is for you. Etap RS postoperative day seven. seven day obstruction and this is the ct scan this is the prs breakdown so that, that is the, yeah. so the prs breakdown, breakdown we should come picture. you get a horizontal line so okay. this is what you see when they go in
So you can see after the PRS breakdown, the bowel has gone inside and got stuck, causing obstruction. So after you take out the bowel, how do you close the defect remission? So <clears throat> we will not be able to approximate PRS again. So the thing would be to put a big IPOM mesh covering the entire Yes. yes. So you have to put a big IPOM mesh. So that is okay. So that is being done here in this case. So Ramesh, is this complication rare and not so frequent? Yeah, Abhi, see the people have started learning ETAP and initially I think the complication rate of this was very high, but I think of late we are not hearing. So people have learned to avoid them. Why does it happen? So basically when you divide a PRS, you will never be able to join PRS because PRS, two PRS are always far away. So you have to actually close only peritoneum. So now what we do is that we divide PRS, we try and preserve the peritoneum as much as we can and eventually we close only peritoneum, we don't close PRS. So that, then it does not lead to the PRS break. Okay. So this is your patient only, Ramesh. Uh, uh, you can take it forward with us. This, this is a video. Anyway, uh, this, this, this anyway uh, you can take it forward without the video also. Hmm. Okay, this was a large hernia with LOD. There was a gross loss of domain. I think the Tanaka index was almost around 63. And we had to optimize this patient. So this patient underwent Botox as well as pneumoperitoneum. And this is up at the end of it, you know, what we realized that she had a lot of surgical emphysema. And we had to terminate the uh, pneumoperitoneum on fifth or sixth sitting and just go ahead with surgery. But the amount of C, the air which is there in subcute, in fact, there is a video here. So if you run, you know, it's a, it's a massive surgical emphysema. So this kind of things happen once you start doing such cases. So you have to be very, very prepared for all this. Uh, of course, this patient did very well after surgery. We had to do a bilateral tar and put in a big meshes and eventually she did very well. But you know, one of the things that happened because this patient was not optimized, her PMI was high. So many of these patients refused to reduce the weight and now I don't operate them if they don't reduce the weight because you're unnecessarily causing tension on your head because these people have very high degree of complications. So progressive pneumoperitoneum can lead to surgical impysema. And this is again, Ramesh, it's your patient only ETEPTAR one year ago. Persistent bulk CT scan of the abdomen bilateral. So again, this video was running. So this video, see what happens. You know, uh, the problem with the abdominal wall reconstruction is it's a very very serious procedure. It's a procedure which has its own learning curve and it has to be taken with its own sanctity. So if this patient actually came through one of the known surgeons, and um, I actually we there was a bilateral seminar blowout. So what he did is that while doing a transverse abdominal muscle, you have to always make sure that your transverse abdominal is on the roof and not on the floor. So you can easily cut through linear seminaries without realizing. And then you will have a massive hernia. So these hernias are very difficult to repair. We, I, we did that and that doctor had come to see. So that time I was just asking him. So he said, no, no, I found it is very easy. I thought so. So I said, what is your experience? Have you worked with somebody? He said, no, I saw one YouTube video and I did it. So that is a problem. You see, these uh, these surgeries cannot be done by just watching YouTube. So the factors which increase the complexity is the dysolysis of prior ventral hernia, large defects, hernia in unusual loca locations, incarcerated hernias, hernias with small defect size but large hernial sac, obesity, bowel distension, pregnancy, presence of ascites. And these are the possible reasons for higher complication rates, poor patient selection, severe additions, incarcerated hernia, content impossible to reduce, inadequate training and expertise, which is very important. Now we come to the groin hernias. So, Rajesh, this is for, for you. Ramesh, no. <laughs> Ramesh, <laughs> now you're going to stop. <laughs> we'll have to wind up now, Ramesh. Wind up, wind up. Yeah, okay, please. let's take one or, one or two. One or two scenarios yeah. of... We have two, two, three questions from the audience. We can audience. understand. Yes, yes, only audience now. No more, no more <laughs> Ramesh Dakarwala. <laughs> I'm feeling too sleepy. Yeah. Just last, this, take this one only. 54-year-old okay. male, obstructed right angular hernia of eight hours, early skin changes, spontaneous reduction under GA. So what would you do, Rajesh? 
do diagnostic laparoscopy yes. and take a decision that's it yes that's it so you have to do that yes so, thank you thank you there are okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah thank you thank you ramay that was very wonderful i think you engaged all the five uh, uh, faculties for the last 55 minutes i think that is a treat to see so many oh. case capsules and we'll have about two minutes for four questions. Uh, there were about 10 questions in the, uh, the chat box. I'll just ask four just to give them all. One, in tap, how to prevent pain after surgery? Any main tips? One from Bangladesh was asking. Uh, Dr. Prateep, uh, Dr. Ajay Kriplani, can you take this? How will you avoid? I think that's a very prevent? important question because uh, if not done adequately, then TAPP can be very painful. So what we practice and what has helped our patients having less pain is that it should be a very gentle dissection. Use minimal amount of energy source. Keep the field dry. Prevent any bleeding. Do not handle the tissues very roughly. Use minimum number of tacks as I emphasized earlier because the pain is directly related to the number of tacks. And after a TAPP, again, we give a tap block. The tab block uh, immediately on the table also helps in reducing the pain. So gentle dissection, minimum cautery, minimum tax, proper hemostasis. Thank you, thank you. And uh, the, another question, uh, this will go to our president himself, a 70 year old man, presenting with bilateral groin hernia. The only history is he had a very bad append acute appendicitis when he was 14 and he has an ugly right paramedian scar. Whether it is for TAP or TEP, why? I'll go for uh, TAPP because uh, I'll do first diagnostic laparoscopy and look inside and do the adhesional lysis. Okay. And uh, otherwise, also my first choice of uh, preferential procedure is TAPP. Yeah. And uh, once I've done the adhesional lysis, I can easily go into preperitoneal inguinal space and uh, do the TAPP. Thank you, thank you. And one, uh, we haven't addressed this issue, but uh, there were about five questions. I don't know why they are interested. What is the role of robotic surgery in hernia? They were asking. Rajesh Kula, could you take this question and give him some answer? Where we stand as far as the robot is concerned in hernia? <laughs> yeah, you see, that is the latest trend to do uh, inguinal as well as uh, complex abdominal wall hernia by robotic technique. We have little bit experience of uh, doing TAPP by robotic. Uh, the view is fantastic. Your uh, depth perception is very good. So your safety, margin of safety definitely increases. Uh, we are still in the learning curve of uh, doing robotic hernia surgery. Uh, the second advantage of robotic is that the suturing becomes much easy to do and uh, you can do a better suturing by robotic as compared to what you can do laparoscopically especially in case of uh, abdominal wall uh, hernias because uh, laparoscopically uh, doing suturing on the roof is slightly difficult yes expert surgeons uh, will have no problem but for the beginners it's a difficult proposition whereas robotically uh, because of uh, freedom of movement of your instrument, you can do better suturing on the roof uh, by robotic. So yes, uh, robotic definitely has some role. Uh, even in uh, abdominal wall uh, reconstruction, uh, Dr. Ramesh Mujani will also agree that uh, robotic definitely has role in so, uh, you know, component what separation techniques uh, because you get better view and uh, you know, the. As uh, Dr. Ramesh said, it is very important to be in the correct plane and divide the transverse abdominus at the correct site. So if you have a three-dimensional uh, view, you have the depth perception, you will be much more precise in what you do in uh, TAR procedure also robotically. So definitely uh, uh, Robo has a role in uh, uh, hernia surgery in uh, abdominal wall reconstruction as well as in hernia surgery. But Thank you. we are learning and definitely it will uh, benefit our patients to come. Okay. So Thank one more you. thing, yeah. AWR is that, uh, so when you are suturing on the roof, you can do image inversion. So your roof yep. becomes floor. And that, that, so you suture as if you are 
So there are plenty of advantages, but somebody has been asking question again and again, are there any complications of robotic hernia? So let me tell them that <laughs> you have, we'll have it in the next prime time. <laughs> it does not make you a foolproof man. It is ultimately taught yes. depends upon how you use that. Yeah. So there are as many complications yeah. as laparoscopic surgery, but you have some advantage if you use it. And the final question is to Ramesh. He was uh, one of the junior. He was asking, thanks for showing so many dreadful complications. How to prevent them all? What is your philosophy? Take home message for a beginner, he was asking. So the first thing is put your ego at home. Then you go into the OR. Know your limitations and experience. So if you think that you cannot do it or uh, you shouldn't proceed further, take the help of your seniors or otherwise. And don't be very heroic in this. Okay, thank you, thank you. And uh, there is one question just appeared. I thought I'll close that with uh, Ramesh Punjani. Uh, one peritoneal holes uh, during TAR procedure, how you prevent that? Any technical tips? He says uh, during TAR procedure, you make some holes or uh, in the peritoneum. I think uh, Ramesh says, uh, yeah, connection frozen. is uh, frozen, but. Uh, but the, while, the, yeah, yeah, while doing tar, uh, peritoneal holes uh, Your to does, not, does not get transmitted to the uh, underlying bowel. And if the button hole happens, then you will have to correct yourself. So you will have to go to another area and come back to that area and see that you don't keep on enlarging your button holes. Thank you. Thank you. I think with that good note, thank you all of you. I'll leave it to Kanagavel. To say Thank final you. word because he is the master of the show for a very vibrant uh, prime time the whole year. I think this is the final program for this academic year. Before I go for a one minute word of thanks. Can I uh, Thank you, Ishwar sir, for holding the fort today. Uh, it has been a pleasant task assigned by uh, Dr. Sunil Kapoor uh, from his uh, taking over. And he has been guiding me all through the entire year. We had international programs, we had national programs, we have many important topics covered up. And he ensured he plans at least one or two months in advance regarding the program. And when we had our national program comes, we ensured that we had to accommodate the date so that we don't miss out on the program. So we have had all the programs except one episode, then we had too much of academics coming in. Otherwise, I'm sure the i think today's uh, attendance of 1400 close to that is the highest for the uh, prime time, time ever i guess yeah so thank you president for uh, bringing us such a phenomenal value to the ideas prime time and i'm sure uh, all the faculty in fact starting from the youngest to the senior most across the globe have contributed their best and i'm sure IAGS prime time will grow more and more in better hands in the upcoming leadership. Thank you very much, President Sir. As a matter of uh, uh, a privilege to the President as a closure of the academic year, I would like to have your closure comments. I won't tell closure comments, your presidential comments for the last IAGS prime time of your uh, presidentship. Over to you, Professor Sunil. Thank you. Thank you, Kunagwell. It could not have been better, highest uh, viewership on a prime time platform with a gallery of uh, hernia experts from across the country. Basically, in last 12 months, we have been doing online programs for almost seven months, and we got a window of four to five months during which uh, we did uh, as many programs as possible. And uh, uh, online programs IAGS prime time on doc plexus has served very well because the doc plexus has the reach of reaching to more than four lakh doctors particularly almost 50,000 surgeons in their database and almost all the IAGS members they are informing by email twice before the program IAGS prime time whenever we is a topic and speaker then the doc plexus team works on it and dr knagwell and dr ishwar gets into it and make a beautiful flyer and then it goes out to almost 10,000 surgeons across the country by email and whatsapp and that is why it is getting more and more popular another thing is the timing because the midweek 
Wednesday evening is such a time where uh, people are still eager to study and join the academic programs. So that is why also it has become very popular. We have also seen that uh, we are getting lots of uh, participation from foreign countries, uh, particularly from the West, from Europe and uh, US and Canada. And that's because of uh, our timing so that they can also join anywhere from their mobile during the day. It has been a wonderful uh, experience, Dr. Knagwell and Ishwar, working with uh, all of you all throughout the year and keeping uh, IIGS academics at the highest level. And I'm so happy that uh, we had such a large viewership. Arunia is such a topic as we discussed at uh, Kanyakumari with Dr. Sivas Fals Arnia, which was just like a national Arnia conference with almost 350 registrations. Uh, that uh, even if you discuss Arnia for three days, you still find that uh, there are still so many things to be discussed. So it's better that we have so many things to be discussed in Arnia and in so many other topics. So in next academic year also, we'll have vibrant online and on-site programs and uh, this uh, program of IGS Prime Time will definitely continue and become much, much more stronger. In addition to Prime Time, we also did uh, three intercontinental webinars along with the uh, UK and Ireland Association of uh, Laparoscopic Surgeons, the ALSCBI. And uh, those were also very, very successful with. Uh, major participation from Great Britain and Ireland. So once again, thank you, Kanagwal, thank you, Ishwar, and thank you, all the faculties, uh, for being there so late. And Ramesh Sagarwala, your uh, topic of complication of inguinal hernia will be dealt with in next year, I think. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah definitely. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, President. I think uh, you all much. the viewers, everybody will agree that we had a wonderful time on pickup of our uh, IAGS President Dr. Sunil Puppert and the whole EC, we hope heartedly thank all the faculties and give them the certificate of appreciation to Dr. Ajay Kriplani, Dr. Rajesh Kular, Ramesh Punjani, Sunil Puppert, Dr. Siva Kumar and Dr. Ramesh Agarwala for excellent presentation. I think we can remember this one of the best IAGS prime time this year, real blockbuster. Amidst all the academics we do, I think uh, this is one particular event which actually draws more crowd. I think it's getting better being second year. This is the 14th episode this year, just incidentally, just want to bring you. And I think uh, we are going to have better things happening this weekend. And also the members will get to know about the guidelines about the hernia and whatnot, all these things in our website. And so keep watching us and please follow us. And we like to see you all on June 9th to 12th at Rajamundri for a wonderful Congress on site. So until then, goodbye, Jai Hind. Thank you. Thank Bye-bye. You. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Good night, Bye. sir.